allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As is our custom, uh, we're going to read our DMC mission statement together. Del Mar College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. As a reminder, Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meeting on the college's website in real time with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. And we're going to go ahead and move on to recognitions, the first one being SGA awards, and that's going to be presented by uh, Rito Silvas, Dr. Rito Silvas. Thank you, Regent Divas. Delmar College SGA officers attended the 49th annual Texas Junior College Student Governing Association annual conference in Addison, Texas this past April 11th through 14th. The conference theme was a new kind of Texas. The highlight of the conference was the awards competition. Delmar competed in chapter of the year for region six, also chapter of the year for the state, video of the year, poetry, and song. I'm happy to report here that for chapter of the year for region six, Delmar College won first place. For a chapter of the year in state, Delmar College placed in second. For region of the year, region six placed in first place. And for video of the year, Delmar College placed in third place. Uh, Delmar College will also be the president and the whole school for Region 6 academic year 2019 and 2020. And they'll be hosting a fall and spring conference at, here at Delmar College. Uh, joining me here today is SJ officers Natasha Perez, Rosalind Swanke, Sofia Jimenez, and Julia Cruz. And of course, their advisors, Ms. Beverly Cage. Uh, the SGA officers would like to show you a two-minute video. This is our entry for video of the year. The video is directed, edited, filmed, and it stars Delmar College students. And a, a note here, even the song you're about to hear is an original song by Delmar College students.
Texas. Texas. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure how that did not win first place, really? uh, but with a few <laughs> remarks here, uh, SGA President Natasha Pettis. Ms. Pettis? Is uh, the girl that composed and wrote that song, is she here also? She's not. Actually, the person who produced the video as well, he was unable to, unable to make it, okay. but those students worked so hard. And um, what we tried to do with these awards, too, was include other clubs in the process of making them. So um, Mauricio, who actually was in the video, he produced the video as well. Um, he is a part of Viking Vibes, and that's kind of more of the artsy group so they're into different arts those kinds of things and so he took it upon himself to share this opportunity with his club members and they actually came forward and submitted some of the songs and poetry and helped with the video so it was really very, awesome. very impressive yes um to make all of this possible we just want to thank you guys um i want to thank you guys on everyone's behalf as well as our advisor um this organization has really helped all of us i think develop our leadership skills uh, and kind of make new friends come together, get to know everyone here at Del Mar, not just students, but faculty, staff, administration, everybody. And so for that, we're just really thankful for all the opportunities that this school has provided us. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Let, me, let me just add that I've been here a long time and we've had a lot of SGA groups through the, through the years. Very good groups, but I want to say that this is one of the best. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Okay, uh, inductees to the Hall of Fame, uh, Dr. Riedel Silva again. Thank you, Regent Rivas. And let me just make a comment to what you just said. I agree with you, Regent Rivas. It's one of the best SGAs I've had the pleasure of working with as well. Uh, on our Hall of Fame, Hall of Famers, would you please walk up, uh, get up, walk up here, please? Here we go. So Board of Regents, being nominated for the Del Mar College Hall of Fame is the highest honor a student can receive at this college. The process is in intense. Faculty members and other college personnel who are familiar with the standards of Hall of Fame nominate deserving students. It is important to note that the Hall of Fame is not just measured by a student's GPA. A diverse committee of faculty members from East and West Campus carefully rank the students on a point system. But that, evalu that evaluation not only measures academic success, but also service to the Del Mar College and service to the community, and most importantly, attitude. So it's my privilege to in introduce the individuals who have been inducted to the 2018-2019 Del Mar College Hall of Fame. First with us is Rosalind Swanke. Rosalind, step up, please. Rosalind has been involved in the Del Mar College Geoscience Society, the Student Governing Association, the Del Mar College Green Team, Phi Theta Kappa, and her awards include President's List, National Science Academic Excellence Award. She's been on the 81st percentile on the American Chemical Society General Chemistry Exam and has been involved with the NASA Space Center intern and deputy voting registrars. Rosalind, congratulations. Rosalind. Our next inductee is Pedro Lopez. Pedro, step up, please. Pedro is involved in SGA, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Phi, uh, Phi Theta, Kappa, Geoscience Society. He's a Del Mar College ambassador, been active in junior achievement, Del Mar College Day in Austin, a graduation volunteer, has been on student focus groups, and amongst his honors, being voted as the outstanding accounting student. Pedro Lopez. Natasha Pettis. Natasha has been involved. She is, as you know, our SGA president, been the vocal Viking forensic squad. It's a DMC green team, also an ambassador with Del Mar College. Her activities, activities include a small business internship program, been involved with Community College Day in Austin. She's also been very involved with the SGA state conference and was a big part of our student food pantry. And among her honors is the President's List, Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and was uh, selected as the Outstanding Speech Student, Natasha Pettis. <laughs> and our last inductee is Troy Nesner. Troy has been involved in SGA and the French Club. His activities include Day of the Dead Festival. He was very uh, involved in getting a historical marker here at Del Mar College. His honors include outstanding sociology student, and he's currently pursuing five degrees at Del Mar College, which are history, political science, sociology, Mexican-American studies, and liberal arts. Troy Nesner. So 
So please join me in a round of applause for all our four inductees. Thank you. Great, great group. Uh, Rito, can I ask you a question? Do we normally just have four, or is it? No, no, no sir, and Ms. Cage can sometimes answer that. Where's where Ms. Cage go? We have, depends on what the committee, no, it doesn't Ms. Cage. It just depends on, on the, the depends. On the nomination, yes, sir. Okay. They okay. fluctuate throughout the year. Okay, sir. thank you. Yeah, I thought we've had more. Yes. Has. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rito. Let's go ahead and move on. Uh, the, our next recognition is with doc, for Dr. Christina Wilson. That'll be presented by Dr. Beth Lewis. Dr. Lewis, Thank you. Christina. The National Community College Hispanic Council has selected Dr. Christina Wilson, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness and Assessment, to participate in their prestigious leadership development program as a 2019 fellow. Christina, come step up here so we can see her. <laughs> I know she's Christina not shy. Christina is one of 24 <laughs> members of the 2019 fellows class selected from community college candidates from around the country. The program is hosted by the University of San Diego School of Leadership and Education Sciences and is designed to develop a pool of highly qualified Latinos whose career, whose career interest focuses on assuming increasingly responsible administrative positions with the ultimate goal of becoming a community college president. Components of the Leadership Fellows Program includes two residential training seminars. The first begins in June as fellows are in residence at the University of San Diego. Each fellow prepares an individualized professional development plan and engages in a mentoring relationship with a Hispanic community college leader as well as attending the NCCHC Leadership Symposium in the fall and carrying out online activities in between sessions. We are honored that Christina has the opportunity to participate in such important leadership programming. It bodes well for our institution and our community that she will return to our campus with new and important information and strategies to help our students succeed. Dr. Christina Wilson. Christina. I'm very excited for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your support, Board of Regents, Dr. Escamilla, Dr. Lewis. Um, I come from a long line of Latinos and Latinas who understand the importance of education and have taught that to, to their children, to myself. Um, I hope that through this program, I can leverage what I've learned to help provide even more opportunities and strengthen pathways to residents um, in, in South Texas who want to attend higher education. So thank you for your support, I'm very excited. <laughs> is, is this a new organization? I'm not, I don't believe I've heard of it. It's been around for a while? No, this is uh, NCCHC has been around for mm, at least two and a half decades, probably closer to three, uh, 30 years or more. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a very specialized group. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a small organization. Um, I think we've had two other fellows That's uh, what as well. My, my next question yeah, um, I think Dr. Leonard Rivera and Patricia Dominguez as well. Okay. Um, right. She's the most recent. And so um, it's a national organization focused on community college leadership and uh, Hispanic uh, representation. So there you Good. go. Great. Thank you. Let's move on to faculty reports. Dr. Beth Lewis. Every year, practicalnursing.org studies vocational nursing programs in each state, offering general information about becoming a licensed practical nurse. In Texas and in California, the term is licensed vocational nurse, as well as the specifics of a college's LPN or LBN program. This year, Del Mar College's vocational nursing program has been ranked number 11 out of 77 college programs in Texas. With us today is Dr. Vanjie DeLeon, Chair of the Nurse Education Department, and Dr. Jennifer McGuaw, Nursing Program Director. I would invite them to come stand up here with me so we can stare at you awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> Nursing programs were assessed on several factors, rigor, quality of faculty, program support for students toward licensure and beyond, and past and present first-time NCLEX PN pass rates. Del Mar College scored 97.88 out of 100 possible points. Please join me in congratulating our vocational nursing programs faculty and students for this prestigious award. Dr. DeLeon or Dr. McGuire, would you like to say something? Uh, well, we're very honored to be recognized and certainly something that we always um, learn to bring forth for our students. You know, we the last two years we've been at 100% pass rate. Uh, and so I think one year in the last five years we were at about 87, but otherwise we've been at 100%. So I think that's something to be very proud of. It and is. we certainly are and very grateful for your support and recognition. 
Thank you. Okay, moving on to staff reports. We're going to hear a report on the 2014 Capital Improvement Program. Uh, August, I believe. You're up for that. It is my pleasure to introduce two consultants that are providing the college with construction management and programming development services relating to the 2014 Delmar College bond. Brett Flint of AGCM will provide a construction update about the existing 2014 bond projects. We also have Daglo of Facility Programming Consulting who will provide the board with recommendations relating to the execution of the remaining 2014 bond projects. Brett? Thank you, August. Regent Rivas, President, uh, Regents, good afternoon. Happy to be here today. Um, as you're all aware, we've, the college had a bond pass in 2014 that uh, was aimed at getting, doing some significant capital improvements on both the east and the west campuses. Um, we have four projects that have been started and are either underway or have completed for the 2014 bond. The first of the, these are the central plant improvements, the emerging technology expansion on the West Campus, the Workforce Development Center on the West Campus, and the General Academic and Music Building here on the East Campus. The central plant upgrades have been completed. Those were started in 2016, uh, completed in 2017. There was work both on the East Campus Central Plant and the West Campus Central Plant. We had an original budget for this work of $3 million, and we completed it for $2,352,943. So uh, we did well there. Uh, a couple of pictures here. This is the new chiller that was installed at the, at the West Campus. Um, there's some of the new equipment that was installed at the East Campus. This uh, will help keep the campus cool on both campuses for years to come. The Emerging Technology Center on the West Campus, uh, we have a construction contract for this work of $8,847,000. This work was started in May of 2017. We currently expect to complete that work, uh, the substantial completion, uh, this month. In fact, furniture is being moved into the Emerging Technology um, Center today. Um, Audiovisual equipment will be installed within the next week or two, and then we'll be prepared to move staff in there probably by July. We expect that we will have full occupancy of this building on or before the start of uh, classes in August. Um, couple of pictures of this. This is the Student Involvement Center. Uh, this is a place where some of the consulting and uh, tutoring activities that take place here on the East Campus can take place on the West Campus. This is one of the corridors. Um, this is the, the front porch, the loggia being constructed. The Workforce Development Center also at the West Campus. Um, I'm not sure that that top number is correct, so please ignore it. We're, we're trying to figure out where that number came from. Mm -hmm. But the uh, construction contract as approved by the board was $14,700,000. Now, we are projecting that we will need additional funds for this, for this project for a number of reasons. We're estimating that we'll be at about $15,050,000. Um, this work also was started in March of 2017. We expect to be complete sometime around the end of June uh, for substantial completion with furniture and move-in taking place, and we are still hopeful to be in there by August. As you'll notice, there is an asterisk by that uh, date, and that is because we have a few challenges on this project. Um, as we've noted, we have some funding um, challenges because of some constructability issues we've run into. We will be coming back to the board with a recommendation for additional funds and a change in schedule if necessary. Uh, most of these challenges are, are due to there have been a number of changes in the scope of this project since it started, um, primarily because this, this program is evolving so fast that we're trying to keep up with it while we're building the, the, the facility itself. Um, 
couple of pictures. Here's the front of the building. It's a nice looking building. Um, Come on quite along. Here's one of the analytical labs in the Workforce Development Center. Um, this is a working courtyard. Um, this is where we have welding bays and fabrication bays, so there is opportunity for students to work outdoors here to move heavy equipment in and materials in and out of the bays here for the workforce development programs. Um, this is the welding bay um, in the Workforce Development Center. And then we have the General Academic and Music Building Phase 2 here on the East Campus. Uh, hold on, Mr. Brett, Mr. Yeah. Flint, if I could. The, going back to the Workforce Development Center, let's talk a little bit about that budget. I want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Please. Yes. Um, the, um, if you can go back, please. Um, there is a budget that we have in every construction budget, and there's also contingency. And what we expect is that we have the contingency in place just for these reasons right here. And, and so um, our estimates for, for, um, for the changes on these, which we'll come back to you, will fall within the contingency guidelines. So it's what the contingency is for. It's why. Um, and we expect them to fall within, so I didn't want to just move too fast through that uh, without some explanation. Sure. Um, some of these changes, too, have been because some the, the equipment that has come on board, there's been some, I think there's some additional coring and some other things like that. Um, yeah. some, some changes because of some donations of that, uh, our, our big donation the other day of 1.5 and things like that. So there is there are some smaller things. But um, that being said, uh, it is still overall within budget. And that's what I want everybody to know to this to this point to this at this point that's where we're expected to yes we're going to be looking towards the contingency to finish this off yeah and and uh, Dr. Eskimi is absolutely correct um, the original contingency that was in the contract was hundred and fifty thousand dollars that represents about one percent of the overall construction cost which is rather optimistic um, where we're at right now is we're at about three and a half percent on changes which is well within what would be considered normal in the construction industry and there is contingency in, in place to do that um, I say we we are very well aware of the challenges we have where we have a path forward and all those it's just a matter of getting those cleared up in time to move the project forward lots of, lots of detailed lots of detailed changes there's some, there are lots of little things that are adding up that are just necessary to get this project through the go across the goal line and again, we'll be coming back to you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, we'll flip the pictures again here. Um, General Academic and Music Building. Um, this project, uh, this has a budget of $45,975,000, uh, a very ambitious project. There's basically four buildings on this project, and working with the contractor, we are now looking at, at having them deliver those buildings individually so that we can move forward with the furniture, the equipment, and getting faculty moved in. Um, so we have substantial completion dates ranging from the end of from the end of May to the end of July on those four buildings. Building A, which is the music building, is the last building to be completed. Um, the good news on that is because that building has a lot of large uh, rehearsal halls in it that makes getting the furniture and the equipment in there a lot easier. It will go a lot faster, so I think we're still optimistic that we'll have everybody in there in time for, for fall classes. Um, and part of this project is we have the Mike Azadula Plaza and the Creighton Plaza or the Quad. Dr. Escamilla's quad he's been looking for, as I understand it. Um, those will should be completed by the end of August, weather depending. Um, it would be nice if the rain would go away for a few days so they could concentrate on some of that outdoor work. Some of the pictures. This is the area where the Creighton Plaza will be. This is between the new building and the library. Um, this would be the Mike Hazadula Plaza. That's between the new building and the existing music building. Uh, as I understand it, the new, the existing music building was actually designed so that they, it acts as a backdrop for outdoor concerts. In fact, I remember when I first moved here about five years ago, one of the first things we did was we came to an outdoor concert here on, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, really enjoyed ourselves, and then the next year they, they had tore it all up to build a new building, so we, <laughs> we couldn't do that anymore. But we're looking forward to being able to come back. 
this is the breezeway between uh, some of the buildings. You can see the uh, breezeways that, that connect, the sky bridges that connect the buildings together. Um, this is one of the instructional spaces inside the building. Um, here you see uh, some of the faculty space on the, on the left. On the right is one of the music studios. Interesting to note that in all the music studios, the floors, the walls, and ceiling are all isolated from the building structure to reduce the amount of noise transmission. Um, my, my daughter is a piano student here at Del Mar, and her instructor is very excited to be able to have a studio where she doesn't hear the percussion guy down the hall practicing. Mm -hmm. um, we said we're, we're at a point where we're getting close to construction and completion. Um, information technology, we have Carroll Systems working with the Del Mar IT staff. They've been active in all three of these projects in getting uh, data systems installed and ready to go. Audiovisual systems, um, we just had the walkthrough with the audiovisual companies on the West Campus last week and are working there. Um, there is a proposal in place for the general, for the Gamby for general academic and music for the audiovisual systems. Furniture, we have uh, Hayworth Whittings is our furniture supplier. They are under contract. Like I said, furniture is being moved into emerging technology today and will continue for about two weeks. And we're working with them on schedules for the other buildings. They are prepared to meet the schedules we, we have. We also have a moving company uh, under contract, Macomb Relocation. Um, they've already met with the faculty members. They have a moving plan in place for each one of the buildings. They're just waiting for us to tell them when they need to, when they need to go. Um, I would now like to turn the time over to Mr. Doug Lowe, and he's going to talk about how we're going to spend some more of this bond money for the college. But before you go, let me ask, yes. on any of these buildings, so we have, have any kind of an open house or ribbon cutting scheduled or? Uh, I know college, uh, college uh, relations keeps asking me when they're going to be done so they can schedule some events in there. So, okay. yes, we're right. working with them on Stay tuned. Uh, having some uh, open houses and a, and a formal ribbon cutting open house uh, dedication service. Whatever yeah, we've had one already. It was earlier on. Um, last year sometime but uh, we'll be working on that so stay tuned okay. sir before you leave I have one quick question sure you mentioned that building a was the music building just for my information what is building B C and D uh, building B is also is music and academic class classrooms and uh, C and D are both general academic I believe the programs that are currently housed in Memorial classroom are moving are moving to into that, that space thank you any other questions? questions? We have a question slide at the end, so I'll come back up when Doug is done. Thank you, Brett. Members of the board, members of the college family, uh, my name is Doug Lowe, and the slide in front of you has the word East Campus Programming. Brett has presented the projects that are well underway and have been completed. I'm going to talk about what's fixing to happen. And programming is one of those words that means different things depending which discipline you're in. And in the world of college planning, it means defining the problem to be solved before you begin with bricks and mortar to solve it. So I want to start with two things that are sort of background. First, all the information you've seen today, you will be seeing today, even though I'm the spokesperson, uh, has been run past Dr. Escamilla and Dr. Lewis and the steering committee. And with the board's blessing, and we continue, there is another layer of, of peeling of the onion, of getting into the weeds with more detail about all of this. This is a board level summary. Uh, and to that point, there is a lot of information sort of below the waterline that if you're interested, we can dig into. But this, this is intended to be a summary for you to bring you up to speed. Uh, we're going to talk first about the classroom analysis, because classrooms and teaching labs are the driving force behind education. We're going to talk about the renovations or the proposed strategy for right-sizing and renovating the buildings on East Campus that were approved in the 2014 bond, uh, the budget for that, and the next steps. So let's talk about classrooms first. And I do apologize starting off with a boring-looking spreadsheet slide. Mm -hmm. I'll walk you through it. It's important background information. If you start in the left-hand column, it lists all of the classroom buildings on East Campus. As you move across the page to the right, it shows the number of classrooms in each building by number of seats. By definition, 
Del Mar College teaches a lot of smaller section courses, so you'll notice as you read across in the bottom highlighted line, most of your classes, classrooms, are smaller size. As opposed to going to Texas A&M, you'd have hundreds of students in a class. The most important number on the page, however, is the bottom right, 101 classroom spaces. Whatever we do in the planning of East Campus, we have to make sure that we don't, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot by taking away space. Now this diagram shows how effectively you are currently utilizing each of your classrooms and classroom buildings. The color code, red, yellow, green, is follows the traffic light, the Sesame Street approach. Again, in the spreadsheet, it lists all of those same classroom buildings down the left-hand side. This way, as you read across the page, it presents factors that influence how well you're using space. What's the enrollment, the average enrollment in each class, in each building, compared with the room capacity in, the, in the, the third column from the left? And it talks about the quantity of classrooms and the weekly hours those rooms are scheduled. Because just like an airline that's flying its planes, it wants to fly them full. Uh, classrooms, you, you have, you want to use your space as effectively as possible. So what this graph shows you is that there is some available capacity in most of your rooms. You're not running full up. And that's a good thing as you move into a, a program of renovating your campus. This graphic presents the same kind of information on classroom utilization Sunday through Saturday, seven days a week. Each line is a different day. And the x-axis is the teaching day. It starts at uh, in our analysis, 8 in the morning runs through 9 at night. Um, this graph shows that, you know, Monday through Thursday from 9 to noon, you are busy. Your rooms are full. But then there is some excess capacity as you move out through the teaching day. Mm -hmm. You do not run a factory here. The objective is not to run 24-7 three shifts. But, as I mentioned before, there is an opportunity for a little bit of incremental improvement in your utilization. Now, let's talk about the proposed plan. This is the same slide as you saw the first time. The buildings down the left, see the 101 highlighted at the bottom of the second column from the left, that's the number of existing classrooms. As we move through our plan, we go first out to uh, 2019, uh, 2021, and 2023, the three subsequent columns. The classroom number jumps up to 136 because of the new building just, that Brett just presented to you, the, the General Academic and Music Building. Then it's possible in the next phase to reduce that number to, to uh, 121 as Memorial Classroom Building comes offline and gets converted, and we'll explain that in a minute. And then ultimately back to the 101 number uh, at the end of the renovation. So plenty of teaching space, opportunities to use it more effectively. So let's talk about what we're going to do now that we know that we have the safety net below us. The plan from 2014 was to renovate the five buildings that are highlighted in blue. And during our programming exercises, we have added into the mix the multi-service center because it's a cog in the wheel to make everything run more effectively. The dash lines represent the campus edge and the Louisiana Parkway to sort of create a, a, a beefed up um, sense of arrival. We have broken the task into three separate phases. I'll go into each one in detail. And it's critical to minimize the disruption. If you think about this, what you're about to embark on, it's like renovating the hull of a ship while you're put out to sea. And to be cost effective and mindful of schedule. So everything has to be well thought through. Prior to beginning phase one, and because the new general academic and music building is coming on and has such a, an impact, there's going to be a lot of moves, a lot of people consolidating into that building from around the campus. So that's the pre-phase. The prior to phase one is do that relocation and you know, get that building up and running. Then we move into phase one. And we think that the first thing to do is to backfill fine arts music 
because that's the building that has just been vacated. Some of the moves are shown in the white bubbles, um, moving the Foghorn newspaper from Harvin back into Fine Arts Music, for example, and relocating Mexican American Studies uh, from Heritage. Uh, again, that's a, a couple of the examples of what can happen just kind of because of the need to backfill space. The key driver, though, if you think about the big dog in phase one, is to renovate Memorial to create a home for the executive administration. If you follow the yellow lines, you will notice that executive administration at Del Mar East Campus is all over campus. And Memorial provides a big opportunity to centralize that and make it more effective. But there's a collateral reason for it, and that is to get it out of Heldenfels. One thing that Del Mar is lagging in is onboarding and, and a, a, a place for first-time students, many are first generation, to come to campus and to easily navigate their way, way through the matriculation and registration process. Now, those kids that graduated in the top 10% of their high school class, they'll just put their head down and, and they'll run through it. They'll figure it out. But you have a lot of students who would truly benefit from having a a, a student's front door to this whole admissions and advising and let's get on board and start our path towards success. And that's what we have envisioned Heldenfels as being right at the southern end of Creighton Plaza. It's the perfect place in our mind to, to do that. So with Memorial completed for executive administration and Heldenfels becoming the student's front door, it's time to move into phase two. And with phase two, Heldenfels becomes that one-stop center. And you can see in the white t uh, bubbles some of the things that are happening. Um, the top one, Heritage Hall. Heritage Hall can be demolished by this time. There's plenty of classroom space. There's plenty of opportunity. It can come offline. But it's also optional just to keep it around as an, as an additional safety net doesn't have to be demolished, it's not in the way. Uh, if you need it for swing space, it might be wise just to keep it. Um, enrollment and admissions staff will move out of Harvin into Heldenfels. Uh, admissions testing coming over from the multi-service center into Heldenfels. So Heldenfels becomes this, this place where students come um, to guide them into their Del Mar path. Another key component of phase two is another thing that is lagging at Del Mar, and that's the, the renovation and the, the reimagining of the library. Um, the library is a lovely library. It's deeply rooted in the 20th century. Your students and your young faculty um, weren't born when this building was built. Uh, libraries, as you know, are serving a different market and a different purpose still hugely important on a college campus, but just different than they were. And so this, this, this is an opportunity to re-envision the library as part of this metamorphosis of East Campus. And again, you can see the, the text bubble. Uh, general testing and IT from the help desk would probably move into the library just as part of this general reimagining re of what the library can do. This sets up phase three. And phase three is renovating this building, uh, also renovating the multi-service center and ultimately demolishing Heritage Hall. Um, I hate to keep beating up on the college, but this building, like what I just said about the library, this building has some age to it. And if you have been on college campuses recently, one of the cogs, in addition to the onboarding process, which we're solving, and the library refreshment that we're solving, or the refreshing of the library, the updating of the student center is a key component to student success. And we think that's what can happen here. And so as we're re-envisioning Harvin, we want to make it about those student-driven activities. And you can see the bubble diagrams as how things are moving around. Uh, the student services and, and student life, you know, those functions come back into Harvin, uh, you know, the, putting more of the, 
the, the administrative type support functions into the multi-service center. It just, it, it just clarifies the purpose of the building and it, it opens up an opportunity to, to refresh it as well. Campus Edge, um, again, the, 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 the East Campus is a very nice place, but the edges are a little, I don't know what the right ad, you, you can use, you fill in the blank. Uh, and so that's what the purpose of this project is, is to figure out how to freshen up the edges and to create that sense of arrival so that when you come to campus, you truly are, you have, a, you have arrived at a destination that is clearly identifiable both around the campus and the Louisiana Parkway entry. So let me recap. Phase one, it renovates the Fine Arts Music Building because of the opportunities that have been created by the new building that's just opening up. Renovate Memorial Classroom as a home for the new Executive Administration Building. One, so administration can function more efficiently, but also because it opens up Heldenfels. Phase two, Heldenfels becomes the one-stop enrollment center, the onboarding heart of the campus, the student's front door. The library gets renovated into phase two and brought into the 21st century. Phase three, the student center follows the path of the library and gets refreshed. And the multi-service center becomes sort of the, the back of the house uh, heart and functional um, heart for the back of the house employees and functions. <coughs> Phase one, two, and three follow a very simple Sesame Street Gantt chart. Um, you know, the, the fine arts music moves and, and the, uh, the moves associated with the new building and renovating memorial for executive leadership. That's really the first thing that has to happen because with executive leadership into memorial, Heldenfels, the middle two bars, uh, the Heldenfels uh, can be renovated and the library can follow along with it. That sets up the third phase to renovate the multi-service center and Harvin. The dotted box along the very bottom uh, talks about Heritage Hall, which can really happen anywhere during that process. We're shoving it to the right just to provide some uh, a safety net. Uh, Campus Edge is the other dotted box along the bottom that can occur you know, throughout the process. As we talk about the budget, the, these are the projects as they were funded and approved by the voters in the 2014 bond. You will notice the right-hand column on this graph has TBDs. As we are moving through the programming, it is becoming clear to us that when these projects were first envisioned back prior to 2014, some good thought went into them but some of those basic assumptions now are, are being revisited and tweaked. We think that the board should decide whether they want to maintain the dollar value for each project as it was originally voted on in 2014, or if the intent of each project is maintained, is there the ability to move some money between projects in order to you know, better achieve the, the 2019 vision of what each one of those improvements were? And that's certainly something for the, for the board to decide. Um, certainly the intent of each project is being maintained. Um, we just think that the budget allocations, uh, the college would probably benefit if you had that flexibility. Yep. And that process, let me, let me just talk a little about that, Doug. That, that process right there needs to be vetted. Some of the projects seemed um, not budgeted as accurately. So for instance, the, um, you know, I think it's the campus edge seems a little, it, it seems very heavy. We've talked about that several times over the, uh, over the past couple of years. And so that what, what, when Doug's saying that, it's not a fundamental shift of dollars. It's just a right sizing of appropriate budgets that will likely come in after programming and discussions uh, from, from the college uh, with, with Doug as our programmer. Um, Doug has pointed out several of them where there's opportunities to uh, tighten up here, loosen up there, use those dollars to, to carry over, including the multi-service center. He has both TBD at, uh, to be determined on both of those, and that's, a, that's the, uh, the center across the, across the street on there is the old HEB um, that, um, that could benefit from that. 
um, if we shift some dollars. And there, there's just an example of, of a couple of uh, a couple of those items. But that's an extensive process, and, and we can we're already beginning to revisit um, the programming for each for that purpose. And if you think about the three jewels, uh, the the Heldenfels onboarding center and student front door, the this building and the library. Um, perhaps when this budget was put together, uh, the emphasis or the vision or the opportunities with those three student-focused buildings may not have floated to the top. And we're trying to push that now. Uh, I like to be a zealot for student success. One other thing, too. Um, the uh, new administration building is a misnomer because it is the original administration building it is the oldest that's an important thing and it's a it's kind of a uh it's it's, it's actually a very nice opportunity um to go back from once we start started and 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 use uh, the oldest building to, to to house not only administration but other other support areas um for the most part it has again probably one of the leaner budgets uh as well we knew that uh going in um, but it is critical. There's one other thing I'd like to say, uh, Regents, um, is that with the executive team scattered the way we are and have been, you know, we make it work and so forth. Um, but it's just uh, um, if we're looking into the future, um, you want to house as many of those uh, functions under this, a single roof as possible. This is our opportunity. Again, in turning, turning um, uh, renovated, newly renovated, and, and state-of-the-art classes to our faculty and staff and students um, is what it's all about, ultimately. Question? Go ahead. Uh, could we turn back to the um, existing classroom utilization report? We certainly can, if I can get us back there. Or do you want to take me back there? Okay. Let's go oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll it back in front. Is that where you'd like to start? Back further? Okay. Two more. One more. Oh, hold it. That one. Okay. Now, I see 1,612 hours. Yes. And we're open from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m., four days a week. Yes. So I would divide that by 52 because four times 13 would be 52. Yes. And I don't come up with 49.9%. Um, the calculation uh, is, the, the formula is a little more complex than that. What we try to do to achieve a target is 32 classroom hours of use per week per classroom. And then you blend that with the capacity so that you get the right number of students in the right size rooms. There is a factor of 75% that we try to achieve for that. So we don't fill up every seat all the time. And those are both based off coordinating board guidelines. And then you get a building, if you do all the averaging of the rooms in, the, in that building, would turn from yellow to green. It would become considered, be considered highly uh, utilized. Uh, so I'll be happy to work through the formulas with you, but it's... Well, it's, it's, it's it that. sounds complex, and I, I'd like to keep it simple. So I, I divide that number by the 52, and then I come up... That number comes very close to what Mr. Alfonso gave me about a year ago, that our utilization is somewhat below 35%, mm -hmm. uh, which seems reasonable, but when we look at this, it looks like we've got half utilized. Well... So I'm thinking we've got 65% additional capacity and this says we've got 50 percent additional capacity so if our student count doubled mm -hmm. in the fall i wouldn't look at this number i'd look at the number that mr alfonso gave me last year and say we can handle it yes uh, what these data are saying is that you do have capacity to handle additional enrollment so you are not you are not using your space full up and, and what would the average percentage utilization be? I think you're running right in the 60%. And your target should be at least 75%. So there's a, there's, there's, as, as I mentioned earlier, the objective here is not to run three shifts 24-7. The objective here is to find ways to better utilize what you have to accommodate the changes you want to make and the increases, the projected increases in enrollment. So. 
this is part of that, that, that data that I spoke of that talks about each one of the individual rooms. Uh, you know, we have gone into it in some detail, building by building, room by room. That, so the, that, that's way too much for me. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm uh, glad you're doing it. <laughs> well, and working closely with August and, and the Ad Astra software program, it provides uh, a great deal of, of backup data. So we, we've got excess capacity, and we will have excess capacity. Yes. Okay. And when we open the South Campus, we'll have additional fix. excess capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I was happy with the idea of the one-stop shop at the Heldenfels building, but how accessible, or what do we have planned as far as parking for first-time students on campus to get to that building and get their needs met? Okay. Um, we can leave that graphic up and you can see there's parking directly to the south. Um, that parking is currently assigned for administrative purposes. I think it's a rather easy reach to reallocate some of the parking close to that building well, well, for the first time student. I mean, it's, it's gated parking right now. Will that be open? I think that's, that's the plan is that's to make it open for plan. everyone who's the, the, the parent, yeah. the student, the, the returning student. It, yes. Yeah, that make it easier. Okay. Anybody else have any questions right now or want to wait till okay, the let end? Let me run on to the very final okay. slides. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the budget. Uh, next steps as we're moving forward, uh, this is today's meeting, and if you like what, what I've shown you, uh, we will finish up the program, the programs of requirements for each of those six buildings. Uh, hiring architects and engineering teams comes next and then the handoff of the programs of requirements to those teams so design can begin. Then the three phases of construction, you can see um, spring, summer, and summer of 2021 and 22. And as I lead into discussion, I want to leave you with two thoughts that uh, after having gone through each of these projects and the, the opportunities on East Campus, um, and also listening to what Brett said, Brett said about the work that's been done here and on West Campus, and knowing that South Campus is coming. I'm going to tell you what you already know, but Del Mar College started here, and then you added a workforce campus to the West. I think it's time for you to recognize the metamorphosis that's going on, that your college now has three pretty co-equal campuses and then some satellites. So if you were in Houston or Dallas, you'd be thinking of yourself as a community college district. You're still just Del Mar College, but you now have three pretty co-equal campuses, and I think you should begin at least planning, because that's my world, to recognize that you have three places as opposed to East Campus and the others. So that's one thought. And the second thing I'd like to leave you with is an opportunity that we've uncovered for potential enrollment growth. You have some very distinguished programs, fine arts just to, to pick the lowest hanging fruit, that draw students from around the region outside of Corpus Christi. And we have found that there's a potential to draw more students in if their path to Del Mar was more convenient. One of the ways to make it more convenient, and please don't shoot me, is to provide a better access to affordable housing. Now, um, some college campuses think housing is an anathema. Some campuses have embraced it. I'm not here to tell you what it is and what your decision is going to be, but because you do have that combination of student demand and exceptional specialized programs, it might be something for you to consider. I'll take that one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a way for you to pick up some of that extra utilization into, into your, in those red and yellow buildings. The, 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 the history of the college, uh, especially, especially the, uh, the fine and performing arts programs were built uh, originally with housing in mind 
if and if you think of any i've heard it over and over from students every time we do surveys and so forth they're talking about you know give me a place to lay my head at night and so i don't have to leave too far and and then when we talk to the students who do come in who still manage to come uh, for one reason or through one way or another um, to the college from places from San Antonio, Houston, South, all the way to the Valley, Laredo, and the like, um, that is a repetitive request, a repetitive refrain that we hear from the students. Um, the music program was built with that in mind. And when the college took uh, the dorms offline uh, some decades ago, um, well, that segment of the students uh, struggled to get here. If you think back to a former regent, uh, uh, Messbarger, she talked about that all the time because she was one of those students from West Laco, Texas, if I remember correctly, who came to Del Mar College to sing in the choir. That's just one example. I know it's a, a, an anecdote, but I do hear that we have heard that over and over from the um, from the students from a, from a request standpoint to uh, to provide that. And so, you know, that 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 is um, that is an option out there i think it's something we we definitely need to to to, to examine and um but uh, we encourage conversation and thoughts today would we um how would we proceed would we have to look to see if we want to do it ourselves or so, private, part, private so there's all sorts of options there's all sorts of options out there and i think and I, i've begun Years ago, um, and years before I got here, I know that was a discussion, but um, I began looking at various models. You know, I came from Tyler Junior College where they had um, numerous beds. I think they had over a thousand beds when I was there. Um, and I've and I've and I know that there are many of the of the other community colleges of the 50 around the state who who do have them. Um, and I know the the challenges that those bring and the opportunities. But we have to look at the opportunities that they bring for our students because if you've ever been involved um, with the housing situation at a, at a university or college, and I have, um, it, it's trickier. Anytime you add anything, it, it, it is trickier. However, if you're listening to the students, if we, if we keep hearing from their requests and, and, uh, and addressing them directly, housing is one that comes up on a regular basis. I dare say that there are enough students here who already are here that would very likely take advantage mm -hmm. of, of that dorm opportunity because of their housing or, or lack of housing opportunities that they currently have. Um, so anyway, it gets, it's a very complex conversation. It needs um, thorough analysis. I've, I've, I've played with some, some thoughts and ideas. I mean, there's, there are models that, that say that, you know, there's the there's a traditional residence hall. We don't even call them dorms anymore out there. I think they're, they're I know they're called residence halls, which are traditional um, um, housing opportunity for students to come in and that sort of thing. There's public and private partnerships, as you're discussing, uh, uh, Regent Rivas, um, to build um, standalone multifamily housing style apartments. Um, there's that model out there as well. It, it, it's going to take in depth analysis and so forth. Um, and I would be glad to do that, but uh, I sure do want to hear what you have to say. Would, would that be part of the strategic plan? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm absolutely certain that we can afford to build it because we borrowed that money. But I'm not all that certain we can afford to operate it. But Mr. Garcia is going to tell us about that. <laughs> So, so my input is going to be very limited at this stage of the game. Uh, I think if we put the, everything on paper and analyze the data, uh, we can definitely take a look at the economic side uh, of this venture. Uh, my experience at Northern Illinois universities, we did have a private uh, public partnership. And so it all depends on how you structure the agreement to determine who's going to manage it, who takes the risk, and what are the financial outcomes. And then discussions around um, how much capacity uh, are we going to be able to serve our students, and then how much of that capacity are we able to to fill? And so, a lot of numbers to run, to crunch, but until we figure out the type of uh, partnership or the type of finance, then we can figure out a little bit more, put put some numbers together to see what makes sense. And and we're going we're going to need a long range plan for that because we've got contingencies like the state legislature to deal with. Yep. So the um, 
that is a, a, another discussion um, that I'll be bringing forth uh, this summer, uh, beginning with the regents, um, about the long-range facilities master planning for the entire district, as Mr. Lowe was talking about, to encompass the full uh, the full capacity of the of the college to so that we're not operating in one sector of the community um, that we we make sure that all the pieces of the of the puzzle are connected as we discuss them to see how one thing affects the other uh, so that's coming and you'll you'll be hearing more from me on that very soon uh, have we thought about what we're going to do in the space where heritage hall is if we demolish that have we if and, if and when we get to that point, um, it, it, it is currently, I think, if it, if and, well, when it goes down, it would be used as a, a an empty space. I don't know if it would be a backup. I don't know if we'd throw down um, asphalt or anything like that. I think... Um, That'd be a potential the, site? For it, it could be a potential residence. site, depending on the funding and so forth, for, for a new uh, Heritage Hall one day. Yeah. Um, that's that those are kind of the talks right now it's very early on um, it would just again we would have to talk about funding and all those sorts of things um, if it's a housing situation or what have you but um, um, it is prime real estate it is right on that edge and um, but it is a uh, I think it'll be an opportunity for discussion okay. more questions questions Sorry. anybody more questions please questions? I have a question with, about the campus edge. Um, the Louisiana entry, does that involve widening that entryway? Do we have any idea um, what we're planning for that entry? The entry and the, the edge past, and uh, I am least prepared to talk about because we wanted to get the kind of the, the right sizing and, and the logic of the campus in place. So we're just now starting on the campus edge in Louisiana. I okay. would like your comments to, to kick that off. Okay. Well, I know a while back we talked about widening the entryway uh, because kind of bottlenecks there, but that would involve having to purchase some property along that edge or along that to allow for the widening. So, yeah, that's something we One can talk about later. One opportunity there is is the sort of the reimagined library yeah. uh, and making that connection as you come to campus a little bit more direct and, and more of a again that sense of arrival using the library as the anchor for the Louisiana Parkway. But again, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm, my, my job is to define the problem, not to, to tell you the yeah. answer. <laughs> well, you, you were talking about programming, and we mentioned a little bit about the Foghorn moving. Uh, are they okay with that? I mean, right so, now they're here in the middle so of the activity. That, that, that was an old piece of data, and I will tell you that that one needs to be refreshed, and I will uh, take a look at that again. Um, because there's lot, we'll have to get down to the programming of all. That's when we're going to sit there and discuss square inch by square inch of this facility and how it's going to be used. And I'm going to throw out there right now that this that this room right here uh, deservedly should go to the students, and we should consider another location for our board meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to factor all that in, and I've already begun challenging the team to say, let's find another place. Um, and this this space right here, I think, would be. I agree. It's it's not my choice. It's not my call at this point. Um, but we're going to sit there and program with everybody and go back. And the, here, here's what we're running up against right now. We're running in 2019. We're running up against discussions that we had in 2015, mm -hmm. primarily 2015 and even 16. So we're going to have to go back and have those um, refreshed discussions, but in earnest, and 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 then program it all square inch by square inch. That's our opportunity. There's enough square. There's enough square footage in this building to do a lot uh, for our students. Uh, the Foghorn. I, I've talked to Robert and and and, and team over there, um, and uh, I don't think that's clearly defined just yet. But um, I think that's an opportunity. Um, and again, uh, Regents. Um, I don't know how much you love this room, but uh, I would challenge us to, to find uh, an alternate space somewhere around the college um, and, and, and give this space back to the students. And we can still carry the name ICNC with us and do some other things, and, and you know, as, as, as I think would be right. But uh, this space in this building is to the degree possible we need to have for our students, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Beverly. I love <laughs> um, Dr. Escamilla was, was right that the, when you plan 
how to re-envision a campus like this one with the legacies that are here, you can start with what I call lining up all the little boxes. Or you can start with the vision of what the campus should be, which is what we tried to do with the library and the one stop and, 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 and repurposing this building. Now it's time, with your blessing, to get into the weeds and, and to make sure that everything functions as it needs to and is in the right home once we have the vision in place. I mean, two quick questions. If you just want some feedback, uh, one is about moving up this meeting space that seems to be the easiest i would think that's that's easy we can go lots of places so i would i would <coughs> certainly defer to to a better use of this place the other is back to the issue of the campus edge uh, i don't know how uh, again we're talking about allocating among those different edges but i would think that i guess i'd call it the southeast corner mm -hmm. would would need the less least amount of definition it just doesn't seem like a I'm, I'm kind of even surprised there'd be much work there at all but okay I just there, that in there. there's substantial it, it is already a very nice location our two south corners are um relatively nice i mean that would just be an i think an up a refreshing and upgrade tying it all into the other corners and that sort of thing i don't think it'd be it a doesn't seem like much of an entrance that doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be the the first place I'm no and, and if you could be wrong if you go back there and see it it's already a very really nice grassy knoll um uh, effect on again on both sides over there uh it's the north corners that really are going to need the attention <laughs> the northeast and northwest um but, but but again you'll want to tie them all together so not discounting any corner of the of the of the property at all um it, it's just a um it, duly noted duly noted yep. dr scamia going back to the housing situation do you have any idea as to when we will have a I guess call it a more serious discussion on the housing situation. So I'm taking this discussion as the um, the beginning of of discussions that I can um, begin uh, bringing to the Board of Regents as soon as this summer. Um, if we can obviously shore them up and roll them into uh, our, our conversations, um, I want to go back in and, and uh, collect the student data. I want you all to hear from as many of those uh, surveys that we've had out there um, about about the housing issue and the requests for the students. That has just been one um, that just one, rec again, recurring conversation that I want to share with you all. So it's coming soon. Dr. Hesme, I'd like, as you're gathering data, I'd like to see if there's any data out there that talks about the, the causation between having housing and additional new students. I'm hearing the anecdotes about how people here want it and how maybe some people would come, but if there's any way to project what would that do in our enrollment, I'd love to hear that. It, you know, we, we are, um, by definition, I uh, would say a commuter campus. I mean, that's what we do. And, you know, we, we live and accommodate the students. And at the same time, you know, the students are asking for those accommodations to say, hey, let me work. I need to work. I need to carry on my two jobs and so forth. And we also know that there's another segment of those students um, that, that are saying, hey, I want to stay here. And then we also know, or we also believe that, that shifting those students' opportunities may very well change their lifestyles for shorter time to completion. And then, then we start talking about the time to completion, um, which is a, a big opportunity for the college. Um, and, and then you start putting all the options together and say there's a combined, perhaps there's a combined um, uh, re uh, residential and commuter uh, type of setup for our students to give them both options. Um, I'll prepare those conversations and we'll, uh, we'll bring Mr. Lowe back. We would definitely look and see what other community colleges are doing. And, First and one to wrestle with this. No, we're not, by, by, by no means. And, and uh, so, yeah, we'll have the data of all the other colleges. We can have, you know, we, we, we'll show what they're, what they're doing. You know, some of them have been doing it and live by it and swear by it and, and, and would do nothing else and others are you know, relinqu relinquishing the opportunities. The smaller colleges that have those setups um, are struggling with, I've seen some of them struggle with the housing situation that are out there, and, but, but, but then the colleges like Ranger, which is probably the smallest college of all in Texas, needs them, is absolutely uh, dependent upon them. So many different discussions out there. You'll get as many discussions and many opinions as there are uh, colleges with housing, but uh, we'll certainly bring the data for consideration. Okay. Dr. Scamia, one more question. I'm very interested in this 
uh, housing situation. I think, if I'm not mistaken, earlier you mentioned that um, Tyler Community College houses about a thousand beds. They how used many, to. How many beds are we looking at, more or less, here for Del Mar? I, it's it's early. It's early yet. Um, I. I would just be speculating at this point. Um, well, you mentioned the Heldenfels building for for housing. Yeah, for the Venters. No. The Venters. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. That, that, as an example of square footage, I mean that's a hundred thousand square feet. Let me let me just you, let me look at it from a number standpoint. A um, hundred thousand square feet would get you about 225 beds, roughly. Uh, maybe a little bit more, 230 beds. So that's a square footage analysis at this point. You know, we have to look at uh, the programming, um, and and the um, I've got and and I do I do uh, look forward to sitting down with more of the faculty uh, in the areas to talk about to talk about these opportunities. Um, you know, when we talk to when I've talked to a few of the music um, um, faculty, and I've talked a little bit about you know the history of having beds and that sort of thing. When they're saying, well, yeah, you know, we're recruiting all these students from out of town, but they just can't get here. There's no place for them to, to stay, but yet they're recruiting them, and they're saying we're missing opportunity after opportunity every semester. And so um, many more of those uh, discussions will need to come. What I'm probably going to, I mean, I can do, I think this summer would be a good time for the board and us to do some analysis. Just here are options, here are disc here's the terminology, you know, here's what housing looks like at colleges and so forth. And what I would need to do is get back in the fall and then begin um, in earnest, having these discussions with uh, the affected areas, the colleges, uh, the, 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 the departments that would really um, um, could benefit from these and so forth to, to, to begin developing uh, uh, themes, needs, and capacity so that I can get to, to, to more accurate numbers. But 100,000 square feet would get you about 225 beds. Perhaps a work. And those are multifamily. I mean, no, not, excuse me, not multifamily. Those are traditional residence hall beds situations. Perhaps a workshop this summer would be good. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, as you put all of that information together, I think one of the things we have to include is feeding them. Yeah. And yeah. because soon after you have residents on campus, they start wanting to talk about a dining hall as opposed to... Very good timing, and especially for this building um, that, that does provide uh, wonderful food service. Um, we hear it from our students that um, um, how much they appreciate the food service and so forth, and that would change the game. That would absolutely <laughs> change the game. You've been there, done that with the university, and so. Um, but duly noted, Regent Estrada, I do have it down as a, a, an impending workshop to be focused and, and, and really delve into the definitions and the whole world of housing. And, and also probably look at the idea of having like a, a private public partnership in an apartment complex or something. Maybe that lot on Tarleton. So the property on Tarleton has been vacated. It's a beautiful piece of property um, that could be a public private partnership. Um, and uh, we'll, I will bring all that information to, to, uh, to the Board of Regents. And okay. All right, that's a, let's go ahead and move on because that's going to take a workshop like what like Elvis said. I think uh, uh, this is going to be a big, big major decision and process that we're going to be working on. There's no question it's going to benefit Del Mar. It's going to benefit our community. And just like Dr. Scamilla said, we're a community school. And, uh, and I think that uh, it really benefit us in, in enrollment, like he says. It's going to benefit. It's going to be a plus. It's going to be a major, major positive situation. But I think that's something. That's, there's a lot of little things that are going to have to be put together. And I'm sure that, you know, it's something that's not going to be just done right here real quick. It's, there's a lot of questions, yes. But like you say, you know, we're going to get, you're going to get together. You're going to put a lot of stuff together. And I think it's something that's very good. I don't think that we have to wait and check and see what other schools are doing. I mean, we're unique. We're different. We're here. We've got the water. We've got it's a beautiful city, beautiful school. And so I don't think that I think it's something that maybe we can just go ahead and be the first to be the leader and go forward because that's what we are. Yeah, but they're, okay. they're, they're already doing it so we can learn from them. Yeah, they're doing it, but they're, they're not doing, doing it close to the water. I mean, we've got corporate. We got it's a different place than the other places. We're unique, okay, in the sense that. You know, we got little towns around here like Tivoli. We had a kid that graduated who was coming every day from Tivoli. Every day he was coming from Tivoli and going back. Tivoli. Right? And so anyway, what happens is that, no, you know, we've got 
the communities around us, our, our little cities, like where we got all, all the little towns around, if we have that situation, hey, it's going to be a different story. They're going to come here, like you said, you know. But uh, I've got a question now concerning, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, and it's a big concern for me and and everything that we do here, because like I said, we're a community, and uh, the people here are very big taxpayer people. And so my question to you all is that. Have you already set up the contractors, the, the, the uh, architects, the people are going to do this and that, and all those little boxes that you were talking about? I mean, do we have, do we have that all set up, or we're going to have a lot of them from here, or what? No. <clears throat> um, that would be the next step would be for us to go out and, and procure those services. Mm -hmm. um, as he showed on the slide, that's the next step. Is that, we, that process has started. We're developing the documents we need, but we have not, do not have those services in place at the present time. And we'll come back for the board for approval for all those. All those still okay. have yet to be approved by the board yep. okay. for consideration. Okay. Is there anything else from you guys? Uh, no, we can. Not from us. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good Thank report. you very much. Let's go ahead and move on then on continuing staff reports. We have an update on the field of nursing initiatives. Dr. Lewis, please. Thank you. About a year ago, um, I updated you on some exciting things that the coordinating board was considering, and not the least of which is expanding the offering of baccalaureate degrees at public community colleges. They did start that process last fall, and they began reviewing their proposals in January. Now, several things to keep in mind. They applied the same criteria and standards to approve the baccalaureate degrees at community colleges or universities. They don't change what the standards are. They're limited to three areas, the applied sciences, applied technology, and nursing, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Now, so far, Austin Community College has been approved for the RN, Registered Nurse, to BSN, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. They have 25 students that started in fall of 2018. In review right now are Laredo Community College, Collin College, and Weatherford College. So one of the questions becomes why are we looking at perhaps pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Nursing at Del Mar College? First of all, Del Mar College uses the concept-based curriculum. It's a different way of teaching nursing. Um, this is why I have Dr. DeLeon and Dr. McQuaw here so that if you have specific questions about concept based curriculum, they'll be happy to answer that for you and how it differs from how other nursing programs are taught. Um, Midwestern University in Wichita Falls is the only other Texas school that uses concept-based curriculum. It's not offered at A&M Corpus Christi, for example. Um, the BSN also supports the common goal of having a very well-educated, diverse nursing workforce to advanced health care in this area. And as we know, we're already underserved in the state with medical professionals. The BSN is becoming the preferred degree for bedside nursing care due to the complexity of health care. And furthermore, a lot of hospitals are encouraging or even requiring their associate degree nurses to go back to school to obtain their BSN. They're hiring practices, they're hiring BSNs first or only. We know there's an ongoing nursing shortage that we're trying to, uh, we generally in colleges are trying to do what we can about that, but it is still a very much an issue. Um, the BSN allows the nurses to have more responsibility and become supervisors, which means higher salaries in the workplace. So I want to show you this chart, and I know there's a lot of numbers on here. Um, the main thing I want you to see is that our pass rates on the first attempt for our <coughs> NCLEX for our students to become registered nurses are very, very good. You can see in 2018, almost 95% of our first time students who took it passed it. Um, 119 out of 126 testers, 119 passed it first time. Those are remarkable numbers. We have the program support and the capacity for this. The total RN grads that we had from fall 2015 to spring 2017, 195 students. But only 41 of those 195, or 21%, transferred to a university for a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And most transferred to UT Arlington. 
Right. Okay. That got that got a few looks. Boy. Why? It's Very online. Lost. It's an online program. Only 13 transferred to A&M Corpus, and the biggest factor in transfer, the students will tell you again and again, the cost of the program and the convenience of classes. The UT Arlington program is an online class. They would prefer to do it face-to-face. -face. They would prefer to do it in person, but that's not an option for them with that concept base. <coughs> We are remarkable in our nursing faculty in the number of terminal degree nurses we have. Currently we have two administrators and 25 full-time faculty. You met Dr. DeLeon and Dr. McGuire earlier uh, in today's meeting. Those are our two PhD administrators. Seven of our nursing faculty have their DNPs, Doctor of Nursing Practice. We have one PhD faculty and six of our faculty are currently pursuing either their DNP or their PhD. That means a little more than 50% of our nursing faculty has or is working toward a doctorate. Now that is highly unusual in a community college. It is extremely unusual to the point where our nursing examiners remarked on it at our last visit. Only 25% having terminal degrees is required by the coordinating board. So we are well on our way. The funding for the Bachelor of Science Nursing Program, the contact hours for the junior and senior level courses are funded the same as lower division courses in a corresponding field, which means we're not going to get any more money from the state for those junior and senior level BSN classes. And we can't charge students in a new bachelor's program tuition and fees that exceed the, the rates for the associate degrees. So they're not going to give us any more money and we can't charge more, but uh, we think it's, it's, it's still a good investment for our students and for the community. So here's where we are so far. They've been meeting with their advisory committee and there is support for that. We've gotten letters of support from healthcare partners, that's Krista Spahn, Driscoll, Post Acute, the HCA, uh, Corpus Christi Medical Center. We have secured required uh, articulation agreements with institutes of higher education. Uh, and I've got a list of those if you want to know what those are. We have an articulation agreement with Midwestern University that would expand to include a teach out pathway if needed, that's a requirement. And then working with a consultant to write the Texas Board of Nursing and Coordinating Board applications. So that's where we are right now. <coughs> Looking at the timeline, so far the RN to BSN concept-based curriculum has been reviewed by our nursing faculty. They have developed student learning outcomes and they took this to our curriculum committee on March 29th and the idea was approved. This summer the team is writing proposals to the Board of Nursing and the Coordinating Board. And then this fall, we'll do a submission of proposals to the Board of Nursing and the Coordinating Board and continue to work with SAC COC because what this will do is it will trigger a level change for us. Right now we are a level one college, which means that we are only allowed to offer associate degrees. If we move forward with this in offering the RN to BSN, SAC COC would have to approve us as a level two institution, which means we're also authorized to offer bachelor's degrees. So it would be a substantive change and it would be a level change. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions or ask uh, Dr. DeLeon or Dr. McGuire to field your questions. I really like what I heard. I really do. I think the best part is that we would keep our tuition pretty much like that would be awesome. And then the fact that a little over 50% of our staff is highly qualified and that's the reason we have such wonderful passing rates. Now I just want to know, can you give us a very brief summary of what content-based nursing, is that what you call it? Concept-based? Yes, concept-based, I'm sorry. Just, it doesn't have to be a long explanation, just tell me what it is. We are one of 17 associate degree uh, schools that belong to the Texas Concept Based Consortium. Um, what it does is it, it integrates, um, let me back up, in the traditional uh, curriculum, if you will, we would have had a separate pediatrics course, a separate mental health, a separate uh, maternal. Mm -hmm. With Concept Based, we're taking those areas, but they're integrated 
all across the curriculum, which really um, we feel it's much better. It gives a stronger curriculum. The students are uh, exposed to the uh, repetitiveness in each semester, pharmacology. So um, it also, um, you know, it helps us, it's concept. So instead of having multiple, multiple uh, different um, disease processes, you, if you will, we teach concepts so it, it makes more sense to the student across the curriculum. If they learn a concept, it can be applied to multiple disease processes. Thank you. Very mm -hmm. good explanation. Okay. My, my question is, can LVN still get a job here? LVNs can get a job, and we still have our VN track yeah. as well. So, um, you know, uh, our VN track doesn't have as many students. What happens is those students that come in as VN, uh, very quickly they decide, you know what, I, th I think I'll change tracks and, and go one additional semester and, and get their RN. But they are, um, you know, VNs are employable here in, in um, our region. So. Okay. I was curious. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we've got, a, we've got a, an agreement with Western Governors University, and they have a BSN. I didn't see any transfers to Western Governors. I don't know. That they are, um, we don't have specific articulation agreements, but we have um, what's called um, educational alliances with them. Um, Western Governors comes to all of our education and employment events that we have every semester, so they absolutely reach out to our students and, and um, you know. But, but our students aren't going there? It's not one of the um, most popular options. Most of our students, as, as Dr. Lewis alluded to, do go to UT Arlington. I, I've heard very good things about their program. Yeah, it's a, it's a quicker, it's a, a faster paced curriculum, lower cost, so many choose to go there. I've got one more question for Dr. Lewis. Should our proposal be approved? When do you anticipate we would start the program? Should our proposal be approved? Um, I think that the, the biggest issue will be getting it through SACCOC, yeah. simply because that is a big uh, institutional level change, and that's a slow process. Yeah. I think realistically, if we mailed everything today, it would be a year and a half. Wow. Yep. Now, is, is this something that should be going through the strategic planning as well, shifting from a two-year to a four-year institution? So it, well, that, this is not, what we're still going to have a two-year program, won't we? But but we will add the four-year on it. This is a this is the major shift, and this is why we wanted to bring the 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 whole package as, as we've been doing research and preparing for it. So moving from level one to level two is a is a major step for the college's consideration. You know, uh, talking about it at at, at the uh, at the uh, board level, would, it would absolutely be uh, appropriate and to for consideration. That's why we're trying to bring all this information in there and to put it on the table for discussion and so that we can keep on doing our due diligence while um, while the board is considering um, this major level change, um, it is a big undertaking, and so we're we're. But the end, um, I, I must say this: that for the first time, I, our commissioner of higher ed the other day, I'll tell you what, he, he's he's very critical of community college programs. Okay, but the one thing that I heard him say just recently was, if there's capacity and if there's need around the state for a level change for community colleges, it's in the area of nursing. And for our commissioner, who was, who's, who's given a lot of service over the past 15 or so years here at the college, um, is supporting this move throughout the state because of that nursing shortage, um, I found that as a profound statement from our, from our commissioner. But that being said, um, that's why we're talking about it now, and we can bring back and revisit uh, all of those specifics. We can break down any one of those specifics uh, to the board, both during planning, uh, strategic planning conversations, as well as workshops and the like. And, and it looks to me like we're gonna have to reallocate some of our precious resources, because this is going to be more expensive. So, so, so we're gonna have to take it away from something to, to allocate it to this. So, the, the, right. I see somebody we, sticking we, up we here. We have so. resources. Yes. You want to go ahead, Dr. Delion? I can maybe speak to that because what 
one thing that we'd like to you know approach the board about is so we're looking for an opportunity and particularly connected to the concept based curriculum our students who are graduating from our program are really our key target because those students started our two-year program here learning concept curriculum so when they go to an RN to BSN we want to be able to open the doors to our concept based curriculum graduates ADN so when we look at capacity and the number of students that we would be able to manage we, we're talking about uh, on the average 25 to 30 students so when we look outside of this there is of course a population of associate degree nurses here just in Corpus Christi and in Oasis County there are more ADN graduates or nurses practicing than there are BSN so that could in essence be very big because those nurses are going to want to come here for that baccalaureate degree but we're talking about keeping it first and foremost to the concept based curriculum grads so again we graduate probably about on the average we're averaging about 120 graduates per year so we would be looking at a number coming from that source going into an RN to BSN so I foresee that uh, when we talked about even how we would fund this we're talking about a, a classroom we have faculty to be able to manage that number of students uh, because a lot of our coursework too is online uh, some of it would be uh, some of it would be hybrid some of it would be face-to-face -face. but we're talking about uh, starting with numbers that we as a department could manage and be able to support and, and so what we'll do uh, Regent Bennett is put a fiscal note to this and 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 put a finer point to um, um, the advantages advantages of having the infrastructure in place uh, the, the, the the talent uh, from the instructional part and from the professorate and so forth as well as the infrastructure and classrooms and, and those sorts of things and compare and contrast with with what we have and what's needed it sounds like so much from what Dr. DeLeon's talking about is much of that is already in place yeah. um, and we'll, we'll show um, what investment level would be necessary for it all obviously none of this goes forward without um, um, review and approval you can tell there's much much work but this conversation needs to happen and that's what we've agreed to do is to bring it back and and again this goes this goes back some years back when um, when the faculty were getting uh, prepared this uh, Benji how far does this go back how, the preparation for this 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 has been multiple years when the when the nurses were all in the doctoral program and so forth together when well, they were in that cohort we, we just actually about probably two years ago when uh, we had seven of our faculty that actually were in a DNP program yeah. and uh, so we had about six of those graduate yeah and then the laws changed which opened it up um, not just for the specific three community colleges that were offering um, baccalaureate level programs right. um, the laws opened up two sessions ago and so the timing of everything has just been evolving over the over the past few years to set us up to that to, to to get to this point well and I and I think going back to what um, dr. Lewis mentioned too and and that is the um, uh, the nursing shortage and that is the health care has really become complex you know our health care partners are telling us you know we're they're hiring our grads and I think they are hire our grads because you will hear time and time that they like our graduates they're prepared they're ready to take care of that patient at the bedside um, however they are concerned about the complexity of health care and they do know that they need that other layer the quality of our program at the two year would not change at all I mean we have done a good job of making sure that that continues and that it continues to be successful we're talking about adding that extra layer on top um, I think our grads just this past semester for this May um, at our pinning ceremony we asked how many of you have jobs probably about 90% of them stood up they already have jobs they're gonna hire them but they are gonna be asking we don't want to wait until healthcare partners tell us 
we can't hire your grads because they don't have that baccalaureate degree. And that is happening in the San Antonio, in the Austin, in the Dallas areas. Um, so we're really hoping for your strong consideration um, for this. Okay. Hector, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, I was in the hospital for a while, and a lot of the people that came over to check me was Delmar students because they had a deal set in Delmar. And so anyway, uh, before I wanted to say something and, and congratulate uh, the nursing department for the, those kids that are there, but I agree because that's what we are. We're going to get the kids ready, the people ready, so that they can go to the next step, and, and that's huge. And I think that's going to happen. That's going to happen. I really believe that that's going to happen because it's very important here for us that our people that graduate from here, they got there, so oh, it's going to be awesome. And then if we can get to the next step, it's even better because, you know, it's going to serve who? Our community. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Lewis, well, let's come back later as an action item if yes. we decide to proceed. Okay, yes. thank you. Well, you're up there. You might as well continue. We have a program review and status report. Okay, so every year um, I give you a status report on our instructional program review process. This is something that is required. Thank you. This is something that is required by board policy. Just as a reminder, program review, it's our systematic way of looking at the components of an instructional program, always with the intent to improve its quality. It is faculty-led, it is administratively supported, and it complies with our SAC COC principles of 7.1, 8.1, 8.2A, 8.2B, and 8.2C. Every year we conduct between 11 and 18 reviews. They're on staggered plans. There's seven core criteria that our program review um, folks look at. The first is looking at uh, achieving student learning outcomes. That's the number one reason we're here. What are the general competencies? What are the program outcomes? What kind of faculty support and program of learning? What's the curriculum integration and mobility? What's the student educational intent? How effectively do we use personnel? What's the cost effectiveness and what strategic advantage does that program have? There are four possible outcomes from the review. There is positive, that's the one everyone wants. Of course, program provides a two-year interim report on recommendations and they're not reviewed again until the next five-year cycle. Conditional says, hang on a second, you know, there's, you're, you're going to have to fix some things and I want to see this again next year. Probationary indicates intent to terminate the program after one year if the deficiencies are not corrected. And then terminate is the program has failed to correct deficiencies after conditional and probationary status. So if you don't have positive right off the bat, you're not going to slide immediately into terminate. We give you lots of chances to fix what's missing. So here's the status report on the 2018 reviews. You can see the list of the positive status on the left. There is um, number six on the right side on pending. It did uh, get a positive status after we had already submitted our slides to the board packet last week. So uh, liberal arts has moved over to the positive. The other ones are still in process. They're still being reviewed along the chain, whether they're in committee or they're with the deans. And they have not made it yet to my office. I would be happy to answer any questions you have about program review at this point. How do you decide which program needs to be reviewed at what time? Okay, so we have a rotating list. Um, what we are trying to do now is sync that cycle so that if they have an external program review, for example, some of our, our drama program, our art program also have their own accreditations. We're trying to sync those. Happens a lot with our allied health programs so that they're not having to do an external evaluation, let's say, for occupational therapy and the next year doing an internal program review. We're lining those up, trying to have it make sense that way. But we've got a cycle that has been planned. It's been in, in the works for years and we just rotate them through. 
Anybody else have any questions? Dr. Lewis, do I understand correctly there haven't been any with the probationary, no negative responses? Is that, am I correct? Not since I have been here. Okay, but the, these particular in 18 are either positive or... Or they're still pending or review. They're still in the process. And and to see them pending is no indication that no. there's not, that there's something going wrong. No, okay. not at all. It simply means that it has not made it yet to my Time, office. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Other questions? Any other questions? None? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Lewis. Let's go ahead and move on then to legislative update. I believe Natalie's going to give us that. <coughs> As Natalie's coming up to uh, prepare for our legislative update, um, just like everybody to know that uh, there's still a little bit of legislative session in front of us. Signee die is still um, about 12 days away or so. <coughs> and um, it is a... Uh, uh, there's still much, much activity, and this is the strangest um, session that I've, I guess it's just, it's unique, everyone is unique, mm -hmm. and, and that there's not been a lot of legislation passed, which is just incredible. And so uh, the timelines and so forth of, of um, um, that are in front of us are, I, I don't know how to explain them, but what we know is that uh, with Ms. Uh, Yarial stepping up and, and, and doing the legislative report, um, that uh, we'll certainly come back to you when, when we have a fully baked, if that sticks, if that, if that means anything, a fully baked set of laws to uh, present to you all. So, so very much about, we're, things are still very much uh, fluid, I guess I would say, to describe the, the current Good way laws. way to describe it, yes. Good afternoon, Regents and Dr. Escamilla. Um, yes, as he was saying, the 86th legislator has 13 days left until sine die, which is on May 27th. Um, so I'd like to give you an update on all the exciting things that are happening, um, really with an overview over allocation, stool credit, uh, transfer, uh, and governance, just to name a few. Um, as you know, Delmar College works collaboratively with TAC and CAT. We strategically watch bills to make sure that anything positive or negative um, that's going to impact our students and our institutions are being watched um, statewide. And as you know, Dr. Escamilla is on the Legislative Committee. He was there yesterday advocating on our behalf. Um, so as he said, there's, um, there were 10,000 bills um, that were collectively filed. So far, we have about 87 today that have been signed by the governor. So that just gives you an idea of, of where they're at in the process. And so um, with the priorities, of course, besides the budget, we also have the tax agenda. So I'd like to start with House Bill 1, which is, of course, the budget uh, for, the 80, for the 86th. Um, negotiations continue. Again, we don't have anything clear cut just yet. Um, for the community college, what does that mean? Uh, those are our general appropriations, our core operations, our success points, and our contact hours that are currently under negotiation. We do have some good news right now. Again, it's not set in stone. Uh, we are at uh, set for $207.86 per success point. So that's up from our last legislative session, which was at about 173. So again, that's hopeful, but stay tuned for that. Dr. Eskimi, anything on that? Well, 215 is the prize, and that's that's where we have our eye. And if we do, mm -hmm. that would yield us another $114,000, just that differential there, that uh, that $8 or $7.5 or so uh, per unit. So stay tuned. We're, we're, we've got our fingers crossed. A lot of support out there. A lot of work being done by TAC. Yes, thank you again. We're very hopeful. Um, on to Senate Bill 500, which is our supplemental appropriations. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the session, they talked about the surplus from the rainy day fund. So some of that is going to be used, um, specifically our community colleges that were affected by Harvey. So that's exciting, knowing that the legislators is looking after us. Um, there's 12.7 million that's been set aside. However, that is still in negotiations. Um, if that were to come through, we have about 97,000 that's set aside for Delmar College. Um, stay tuned. <laughs> that's, that's one that we're not really holding our breath on. Uh, but uh, it is a smaller, relatively speaking, a smaller number for Delmar College. But I'll tell you what, there's some smaller colleges out there that were affected by uh, Hurricane Harvey that can certainly use the dollars. And they were substantially more for them. So um, we're, we're advocating for all the Gulf Coast colleges affected for it, uh, affected by the storm. But um, we're, we're not putting a, like I said, we're not holding our breath on that one. 
Now, of course, uh, the main one is the SB2, which is our property tax. Uh, as a reminder, that limits the amount of tax increase that the taxing entity um, can have on your property tax assessment, you know, without voter approval. There are two versions of that going on right now. Of course, um, the favorable version is, is the House version of Senate Bill 2. We are currently exempt uh, along with the hospital districts. Uh, cities, counties, and special service districts are at a 2.5% rollback on that one, and the ISDs are at a 2%. Again, that's the favorable version. The, uh, the Senate side um, does not have us exempt at this point. Um, we, along with cities and counties, are at a 3.5% rollback rate, and the ISDs are at a 2.5. So as of yesterday, uh, TAC and um, the rest of the community college world have been strongly advocating um, on our behalf. So uh, stay tuned. We'll see where that ends up this week. And actually, I do have a Texas Tribune article um, that addresses that issue, so I'll send that to you this afternoon after the meeting is over, just so you can get an idea of what the rest of the state is saying. Now, we really thought dual credit was going to be a main area this year, main area of focus. Um, however, due to the studies um, that came out this past summer, the UT study and the RAND study, they really did a good job of negating the issue with rigor. So because of that, we've, we've moved on from dual credit. Um, however, there are some bills out there that do address it. And I wanted to point one out to you, which is Senate Bill uh, 1276 by Senator Powell. This one is actually um, seeking to improve the collaboration between the K-12 system and higher ed. And specifics to that bill include you know, common advising strategies, um, aligning the endorsements between the institutions, identifying tools to assist counselors and, and families. So again, that one does seem to have some traction. Um, it was voted on by the House and House Committee, so it is going to the House calendar. So we'll, we'll keep you abreast of that one as we move forward. Now, the major focus um, this session um, with regards to higher education institutions has been transfer. Um, so Senate Bill 25, you've heard of before. That was the one by Royce West. This one specifically looks at the restructuring of our general core. Um, now, if you remember, there were some technical words that we discussed, such as bifurcating the core, um, really trying to split up general core classes um, to help our students as they're transferring. That really hasn't been um, noted as successful from the university standpoint or the community college standpoint. I'm happy to say that the universities and community colleges have been collaborating uh, to amend this bill, and that was done last week. Uh, Dustin Meter with TAC, along with the University of Texas system, the Texas A&M system, and UNT have all gotten together to discuss this bill. And that has been looked upon very favorably by the Senate. Um, so what, um, what we've asked is, instead of a 30 by 12 split, is instead to, um, to give this to, um, to the intercession and actually have a study conducted where all parties would be equally represented. Um, the Senate did agree to that. And actually, as of this morning, um, that was passed um, by the House Committee, which means it's going to calendars. That is a, a, a very critical piece of legislation that really is about the core uh, of the curriculum uh, for all colleges and universities. And I have got to uh, applaud the work done by Senator Royce West in leading this discussion and holding the ground for, for the community colleges. Uh, the universities had their version of what they expected the core to look like and for us to come out of this session with a 42-hour core still intact uh, with negotiations in front of us uh, tells us that for today and for now we are we are safe but uh, we are going to be um, ready to to meet with uh, the the university so that so that we uh, anything done with our core uh, is not done without our um, oversight and and hopefully approval it's exciting that we've been invited to the table so well, when we started out with a 24 and 18 bifurcated core that was really one-sided and not anything that we'd we'd had um, uh, approval or support on uh, and then come all the way down to you know what let's just let's stop this train and and keep the core the way it is um, that that came from a lot of uh, intense work and people who are listening, elected officials who are listening to um, the community colleges from around the state. 
Now, the deadline for the House to pass the Senate bill is May 21st, so again, we should know pretty soon here. Um, now, moving on, um, there were some bills that affected the governance area. Um, one that was heated that you've heard about before was Senate Bill 2344 by Creighton. There was also another House bill that went with that. That was the non-contiguous annexation of a school district by a junior college. And um, we are happy to report that both of those bills uh, did not leave their committees. And so at this point in the game, those are done. Um, as you know, that's a big win for community colleges that could have opened up much bigger issue in the next session. So we're actually really excited that those bills are, are dead and, and put to rest for now. And then the last one I wanted to bring to your attention was um, Senate Bill 18, because this one has to do with free speech. And you as a governing board will have to create policies if this one is passed, and it is gaining traction. Um, this one has to do with speakers on campus. Um, some of the pieces uh, to that bill um, would make sure that the college um, is obligated to provide speaker protection. Um, and even doing detailed things like um, adding the event to the, uh, to the website, to the college website, in a timely manner. Um, now, with these types of bills, TAC has asserted that if, um, if these things pass, they will be doing a special workshop for our regents. Uh, that way you can uh, talk about best, pra best practices over the summer and, uh, and go from there. That one as well, um, again, is gaining traction, so we'll see where, where, how far it goes. There's a lot of bills out there. If there are any bills that you have heard of that you have questions about, please feel free to email me and ask me. Again, this is a snapshot, um, but because, of there's, because there's so many bills out there affecting our institutions, we really do follow a playbook with TAC and try to really strategically work on the ones that, that could be an issue. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any questions? You have a good report, Natalie. Thank you. We have 13 days left, so hopefully by the next uh, board meeting, uh, we'll be able to give you a synopsis of, of the 86th and go from there. Plus uh, special sessions. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> hopefully not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to college president's reports. Well, very quickly. Yeah. The, thank you, sir, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the um, the three dates mentioned are all about what Natalie just talked about. It's just spending time up, up in Austin and, and really focusing in on that. Um, I just, I'll, I'll use my, the, my time this, to this morning to, to just, again, mention the, the, the level of cooperation and, and, uh, and just outright hard work that both TAC, Texas Association of Community Colleges, and CAT, the Community College Association of Texas Trustees, um, plus the teaching, uh, the Texas Association of Community College teachers is TACTA, um, that those organizations coming together in Austin um, have really um, made a profound difference. The legislators are listening uh, like I believe never before, and the amount of work that is going in um, is, um, is like I've never seen in six sessions, six legislative sessions. And what what, they're, what, what the team is already talking about is signy die is on May 27th, and then the next day we begin in earnest with the interim studies and interim conversations. In other words, it doesn't ever really stop, and we know that, and we're getting ready. So that being said, uh, I will be up there for a few more days, um, I think, before the end of the session, and I'll bring back a report. And great job, uh, Ms. Villarreal, on the legislative report for your first one. Good job. Okay. Uh, pending business, are we still? We're all up to date on the pending business. We have a, have a sheet. It's on my, it's on the agenda in the, in the uh, I don't see it on here. Oh yeah, it, it's in here. I don't have a separate sheet for pending business, but it was in, in the uh, the agenda that was mailed. That was an email to us, or was sent to us on board effect. On board effect. The only two issues for today are the naming policy and manual revisions. Policy manual revisions. We're going to touch on one of those. Both of those. We're going to touch on one today, and then uh, number two is a. Uh, we'll have a substantial. Um, action item for your consideration. Okay, the rest for June. The only thing I'd like to see that you're going to add to that would be the uh, the issue of 
either dorms on college or just start looking into it's, that it's, possibility. Yeah, it's been noted, um, okay. and so we'll be we'll put it into the okay. into All the right. calendar appropriately. And we can go ahead and move on then to the, our consent agenda. Our consent agenda: we have the approval of the minutes of a uh, meeting of April the twelfth. The call meeting of April the 12th, the regular board meeting April the 23rd, the acceptance of investments for April 2019, the acceptance of financials for March 2019, and if there's anybody that wants any of those pulled for separate discussion, we can do that. If not, I will entertain a motion to accept consent agenda. No. Moved and seconded by Mary Sherwood, um, moved by Dr. Adame. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those again, same sign. The motion passes. Moving on to our regular agenda, we have a discussion of possible action related to the designation of a general contractor for the first phase, phase 1A, of our South Campus. Exciting times. And we have August Stafons and yes. David Dovely that are going to present this. <coughs> Good afternoon. I have Brett Flint from AGCM and, and Philip Brent. Ramirez from Gensler Turner Ramirez Architects Philip. here with me to present and answer any of your any questions you may have. On April 2nd, 2019, the college issued RFCSP number 2019-08 for the construction of the South Campus Phase 1A package, which is the central plant, utilities, and ex excavation. The following six firms submitted statement of qualifications and competitive seal proposals. Barcom Construction, Beekoff Construction, Fulton Coastcon Construction, Journeyman Spoglass Construction, and Teal Construction. Design of the South Campus Phase 1A was done by Gensler Architects and Turner Ramirez Architects. The committee Membership include, included Dr. Beth Lewis, Chuck McKinney, Laura Wright, Lauren White, Robert Duffy, Jeff Hoddle, Laura Montemayor, Regent Gabe Rivas, Regent Dr. Nika Dami, Regent Hector Salinas, and myself. The evaluation committee's recommendation for the general contractor for the South Campus Phase 1A, Central Plant, Utilities and Excavation, or Package 1 is Fulton Coastcon Construction. Base bid is 9250000 Bid alternate is at a cost of 1145000 For a total base and alternate bid of 10395000 I also want to remind the board that the budget for this phase, for this package, is $10,900,000. I want to recognize AGCM and uh, Gensler Turner Ramirez for their work in getting us to this point to note that all bids were under budget. It was a good day for to be a member of this committee. <laughs> the administration is seeking board authorization to commence with contract negotiations and also for the reallocation of the 505 surplus budget back into the project for use in package two of the South Campus Construction Project. Thank you, August. On behalf of the board members that were on the committee, I'd like to thank the committee that took time all day long to evaluate these contractors. We had some good bids. We had some very, all the contracts were very well qualified for this job and the committee did a good job of evaluating and, and, and rating and pointing and I think the, the vote was unanimous. I would like to go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Adame who served on the committee to make the motion. Uh, I would like to make the motion that based on the recommendation of the committee that met today that, that we um, uh, select uh, Fulton Construction Company as the um, selected contractor. And Dr. I second that. Salinas will second that. Under discussion, um, 
if any of the board members have any questions at all about our, the process or about the contractors or about the rating or anything, we'd be glad to try to answer them. Either us or Philip is here and Brent, August. No questions? Everybody's happy? And we'll call for a vote. Uh, let's do a roll call vote on this, Delia, please. Oh, I'm sorry, public comments? Anybody from the audience? On the Yeah, on, on the motion. On, just on this motion. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Let me ask uh, Susie Saldana to step forward and offer her public comment. Susie Lena Saldana, I'm a community activist. Uh, I do want to take this time to thank you all for actually listening to our input and on your goal, you say uh, construction, but it's also community success. And I think that by looking at what you have done with this group and uh, taking the local people that you attribute to elevate us more to that community success. So I really want to thank you for doing uh, the recommendation in the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Uh -oh. Is there anybody else that would like to offer public comment? Nobody else? Okay. We'll go ahead and call for the vote. Roll call vote, please, Delia. Dr. Adame? Yes. Ms. Averett? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Estrada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Mr. Salina? Yes. Dr. Sherwood? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, guys. And I'd like to thank all the contractors that actually uh, submitted bids that were interested in this project. Thank okay. you. Go ahead, August. Okay, let's move on to agenda item number two, five. Discussion possible action related to the proposed new enterprise resource planning. And I believe August is going to give us a report. As Mr. Alfonso is preparing, I'd like to say, Regents, that this is a, um, this is a, uh, this item for your consideration has been long coming. And um, I think there, there are many, um, the many reasons for the, the the long fuse of this one on this one, if you will, um, but this is a, an opportunity for your consideration to um, bring the college into a, a new generation of of um, technology uh, to support every aspect of the college, and I, I just would like to, um, before your consideration, thank the entire college for um, having come together. Uh, to prepare this for your consideration as we move um, as we move forward. So again, thank you, Mr. Alfonso. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. The rationale for adopting a new ERP. Uh, I was trying to be as politically correct in line number one. <laughs> I've heard it from you. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to repeat what I heard from many, from you, our faculty, our students, my very own daughter when she came here three years ago. Uh, it is time to move from, if I want to analogize, from the old type flip phone to a smartphone. It is time for this college to embrace new technology just, that just recently became available to higher ed. It is time to embrace change. Why? Current and future student expectations are changing and will continue to change. Gone are the days where we have to use a keyboard. Many of you here no longer use keyboards. Soon you're not going to use a mouse. It's all touch screen now and even artificial intelligence. Many of you have Alexa in your homes. Our students are going to expect that when they try to get to the college and when they are here. And in some instances, our faculty are going to expect that as well. Okay? And along with that, we gain better, faster service, access to our data, and efficiency will also be gained by a more intuitive, intentional technology tool. I have uh, members of the committee that are here ready to speak 
uh, on why they voted. Uh, there were nine members of the committee, and unanimously they voted for the migration to the new ERP, and unanimously recommended a product for your consideration. And I'm going to start with uh, our faculty council rep, uh, Craig. And any other members of the committee that are here, uh, you're welcome to to join me in, in talking about the value that migrating to a new ERP can bring to the college. Good afternoon. I'm Craig Brashears, a uh, professor of drama and a former chair of the, uh, the faculty council. Uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you about this uh, very, very briefly today. Uh, I've been teaching at Del Mar College for a good while. Uh, about, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, I uh, walked across a little platform upstairs and Dr. Escamilla handed me my 20-year pen. And uh, maybe, that, maybe that makes me vintage as well, but... <laughs> <laughs> But when I first started here, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if what we had you would call an ERP. It may have even been like a DOS-based system or something. I don't remember. <laughs> OK, it's just an ER. Um, and uh, when we submitted our grades at the end of the semester, we actually had to bubble them in on, on little sheets and duplicate and hand walk them over to the registrar's office where someone would key them in for, uh, for, for transcripting. And uh, then a couple of years after that, we got uh, what would what we're referring to now as an ERP, and it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I could submit my grades online. I could bring up a student record on my uh, office computer and help advise. I could register students on my computer. And this was absolutely wonderful, worlds above uh, bubbling in uh, little, little grade sheets. Well, we fast forward 17, 18 years uh, to the current day. And um, there's been a, a, a massive amount of growth and progress, evolution at this institution. Um, our, our current uh, vintage ERP uh, ha has not really been able to keep up with that, that evolution. And uh, those functions that were worlds and above what we had before uh, have essentially not evolved uh, to meet our, our, our current needs. Uh, so. When, uh, when I go to a register, uh, uh, advise a student right now, uh, only one person can be logged into that student record at a time. Uh, if I'm logged into that student's record, I have the student sitting across my desk. If I have a question for the registrar, I need to log out so the registrar can log in and look, and then log out so I can log back in. Uh, we've been using Canvas for a good number of years now, a good number of years. How many years have we had? Uh, eight months. About eight years we've been using Canvas. Our uh, current ERP is not integrated in with Canvas. I don't believe there's any plans to do so. So when we go to uh, input our grades, I've got, I've got two windows open on my screen. I've got Canvas with my grade book, and then I've got our ERP where I'm entering in my grades. And some of us that uh, also teach dual credit students have to enter in numeric grades for those dual credit students, which is a third program. So I've got three windows open. Um, we're back to bubbling in grades. Um, and that's been very, very frustrating, and it got to the point where the faculty just said, en enough, enough. Uh, we need something that is better. Uh, Dr. Escamilla has been incredibly receptive to that. Uh, he put August uh, to, to lead the charge here. I've been working with him for uh, about two years on this. Uh, our first task was to, first of all, see if there's something out there that is better than what we've got now. Because we don't want something new. We don't want something different. We want something that's better than what we've got now, that can meet the needs of where we are, this evolution that we've experienced since we, we first uh, kind of got into this, uh, this ERP. And uh, we did discover that there, is, there are potential vendors who can provide uh, what we need and are, are very unique but very diverse, uh, diverse needs. And um, so we've got a lot of new programs coming on, uh, on board with our new QEP, our strategic plan, our pathways initiative, uh, integration with Canvas and things like that to, to really not only uh, meet our current needs but help us evolve 
as as the as as the college evolves, that that ERP can evolve uh, evolve with us, and so the faculty uh, were uh, uh, were very supportive to look at uh, at a new ERP. And while the faculty and the staff as well uh, have been kind of frustrated that perhaps there weren't a lot of choices out there. Uh, there certainly are choices out there uh, that I think are going to provide us with uh, something truly better than what we've got now. And so we, we feel definitely the time is right, the time is now uh, to adopt a new, a new ERP. So thank you for your time. Good afternoon, I'm Carolyn Sorrells. Um, I am the chair of the non-exempt council and also I am working in institutional research. So I'm representing both of those um, positions today for the ERP. As chair of the NEC, the first thing I was impressed with when I went to the campus management presentation was that they focused entirely on community colleges and specifically those community colleges in Texas. To embody that commitment, they created and staffed a Texas Service Center, which will provide full support for the creation and submission of our coordinating board reports. In addition, they also provide resources to work alongside DMC to ensure compliance with other coordinating board requirements, such as the Texas Success Initiative, Guided Pathways, and other 60 by 30 programs. One thing that struck me during the presentation was that they kept reiterating that everything we saw what came out of the box and it was not an add-on. I've worked at other colleges uh, at Baylor in particular where we switched over to PeopleSoft at one time and we ended up having to customize and spend tens of thousands of dollars more to get what we wanted. This presentation showed us that everything that we possibly could need came out of the box and he actually said that what we needed he could configure at no added cost instead of customizing which would be um, an added cost to us. So I was very impressed with that. From the institutional research perspective, campus management has the ability to provide great innovations such as the Occupation Insight, which is a workforce analytics solution that can help Delmore better align academic programs and student skills with industry needs. Um, this is a, a really important report that we're often asked to provide uh, to the workforce area and allied health. So that's going to be a blessing for us when it comes to report time. Uh, they also provide a data warehouse and they provide views for enhanced ad hoc reporting and provide robust features for reporting and analytics. Uh, campus management also has support for state and federal reporting, such as iPads, which will be invaluable to IR. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Patricia Dominguez. I'm the Dean of Outreach and Enrollment Services. And what impressed me most about campus management <clears throat> was their registration and degree audit functions. As you know, our students are online 24 seven and sometimes it's just not convenient to call and get an advisor on the phone, whether it's a faculty advisor or, or many of our other uh, advisors here on campus. And so when you log in that system and if a student is trying to register for a class, it's interfacing with the degree audit uh, functionality that it has. And so if a student is trying to register for a class that they've currently already have taken or transferred in, it, it, the system is intuitive enough to respond to the student saying, hey, you've already taken this course. Do you still want to take it? And so that really impressed me because as you know, we, we need this tool can help us with time to completion 
for students. And so that immediate response, whether it's at noon or at midnight, was very impressive to me. Uh, the other feature that I was very impressed with was that campus management has committed to having personnel to help us with all the reporting requirements. As you know, in my area, uh, we are responsible for co-board reports, state reports, federal reports, just like in the financial aid office and the registrar's office. And so it, I know that uh, campus management <clears throat> has call it community colleges in California and in Florida, and those two states have very uh, they heavy users of uh, reporting federal uh, and state reports to those in those states as well. And of course, the other uh, feature that I, I was most impressed with was their uh, CRM, which is their customer relations management tool, and that's a, a very good outreach tool because we have students that are. Uh, emailing us, students that are, when we are out at community events and we are uh, mining that information, we like to be able to come back and contact them and have a way, uh, a more effective way of, uh, of outreaching to those students. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. And Jay? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Keenum. I'm representing uh, College Relations on the committee. And uh, just to dovetail off what Patricia just said, uh, our office works very closely with enrollment services and recruitment to provide them the materials and resources that uh, they need to do their work. And uh, to uh, reinforce what she just said about the CRM component, our office does a lot of the emailing uh, for, on behalf of their office for, uh, to students using uh, third-party systems like Constant Contact, uh, Mailer Light that are offered on, uh, that are, these are vendors that we uh, contract with to, to email on behalf of the college. This CRM component will eliminate the need to use those third-party systems so we can use all in one one-stop shop. Uh, so we can, we don't have to work with any of these other systems. Uh, it'll be, it'll enhance efficiency and a little, it'll decrease a lot of the person hours that we need to use uh, on behalf of the, this office. And we can move some of these functions over to the SEC, uh, the Student Enrollment Center here on campus, instead of having to use two different offices to do this one, to do this one function. So that's one of the major advantages of this system. Uh, another one is, we can, uh, we can use the system to generate reports of data, such as mailing lists, uh, phone number lists to do, to do text messaging on behalf of the college. Um, where before, in the older system, we would have to go do all these things through IT, uh, using their staff to, to pull the, their staff to use from other functions to do this one uh, report generation. Uh, in, in campus management, we can, staff can pull these reports on their own uh, whenever we need them, um, so we can, we, again, it increases efficiency, but it also, for one function that we do in our office for direct mail, uh, we can send these, uh, we can send our mailing pieces out, we can pull uh, mailing lists whenever we need them, um, and it makes direct mailing a lot faster. So these, uh, these, just these two uh, uh, processes would be uh, made much faster, much more efficient, uh, just alone from the, from the uh, campus management tool. But um, uh, emailing to student contacts, uh, the the job outlook data that uh, we talked about before, um, we can in the the system can return uh, salary averages and other information when students are using it. Uh, we can use that same information throughout our promotional efforts. So uh, it's it's an invaluable tool. So uh, I'm glad to uh, advocate for it. I was glad to vote for it. Thank you. just like to find out that uh, this will be the first time this college will have a CRM or a customer relation management. So that is a, a big plus in addition to the traditional ERP. August, what is the budget for something like this? Uh, How much money are we talking about? Yeah. At this time, uh, does it come into that or own? Well, okay, what they're asking for today is for authorization, authorization to, to proceed with co contract negotiations. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you, if you recall when I asked for your approval to release the RFP, uh, the same question was posted, and I said, uh, they're, they're watching. I don't want them to know our budget. 
the um, at the same time it, it is it, the bidding purposes and all. at this point at this you're point. just going to enter into negotiations with them yes. that's correct and that's at uh, at the time that we contract with them how long did it take before we go online or how long before we start uh, the system the proposal that i have for the college consideration is that we are going to go live by spring 2020. Okay. Two years. It is an 18 to 24 month uh, project, as opposed to the prior projects, an older technology that took between three to five years. Spring 2020. 2020. 2020. That's, that's one year. Uh, no, no. One year for the student and the second year uh, for uh, HR payroll finance. You were interviewing consultants a while back. Okay. Yes, sir. Let me, let me go to my recommendation, and, and I'll mention uh, the entire proceeding. Okay. Okay. The following seven firms submitted responses to request for a proposal for consideration. Illusion, Collaborative Solutions, LLC, Navigator Management Partners, Oracle, American Incorporated, Workday, Campus Management, Gensbar. The evaluation committee members included the following, Dr. Rito Silva, Dr. Kathy West, Dr. Beth Lewis, Jay Kinium, Tammy McDonald, Sushil Kalimoni, Javier Escamilla, non-exempt rep, and Caroline Sorrells, you heard from her today, representing the non-exempt council, Greg Brashears, representing faculty council, and myself. The evaluation committee's recommendation for a new ERP system is campus management. The administration is hereby seeking board authorization to proceed with contract negotiations. Okay. We're entertaining a motion then to give them permission to proceed with negotiations. Anybody want to make that motion? I'd like to make a motion. I will make the motion, second by Mr. Bennett. Any other discussion? Do we have any public comment on this motion? We've heard from everybody on the committee. So let's go ahead and go for a vote then. All those in favor of the vote of the motion? Signify by saying aye. 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 All those again, same sign. Motion passes. Okay, August. Thank you, sir. I want to point out that we have representatives from campus management. Oh, good. At the board yeah. meeting today, if okay. you want to hear from them. Okay. Do they want to stand up and say hi? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, August. Okay, let's go ahead and move on then to um, where are we at? Um, six? Yeah. Discussion possible action related to facility naming policy. Mary McQueen. Okay, this is an update from last month. Um, looking at the processes just very quickly. Going again, here's the processes we're using. The next one. Uh, do I have do I have control of this? Yes. Holy, I do. Holy shkamoli. All right, so the processes will review the policies, look at other community college policies, develop the scope for this particular policy. Last uh, month, we got input from the Board of Regents and then revised the policy based on that input. Uh, again, looking at the purpose, the purpose is primarily find ways to honor those who are connected with the college, whether they're connected by virtue of support for gifts or for their service. So um, we, that includes individuals, organizations, entities, what we're hoping to do is use this policy to connect individuals to our community college to let them know and let the rest of the community know that these individuals um, have supported the community college mission. We also want to be able to utilize this as a way to leverage and encourage additional levels of support. Um, then, of course, establish those guidelines and processes for consistency. Based on the feedback we got last month, um, the overview, you have the full policy in front of you, but the overview is that the Board of, of Regents would approve all naming. That information is located in B3.7, paragraph 2. Also, 
ter limited term naming rights, which was another thing that this board had asked. That's addressed in B 3.7, paragraph 3, kind of outlining what naming rights would be, and that would be what we're terming those, uh, those naming considerations which are of limited duration. Academic coll colleges are under the naming policy. That's addressed in A3.7.1 and A3.7.4. The endowed naming I expanded per request from the board. Um, so we looked at that, readdressed, re um, addressed that component in B3.7, pa paragraph 4, and also A3.7.4, which is a new component that was added to this policy. And then changes in naming circumstances, another con uh, concern that was recommended we look at. It was in the policy, but more specifically, it's an A.3.7.6 A that addresses if there are changes in the naming um, that need to be addressed. So the board, again, has final approval for all naming rec recognition. The administration will manage the process, the procedures, the criteria, and the standards for all naming. Um, therefore, the administration will vet and rec uh, recommend naming proposals to the board for final approval. Um, endowed for endowed naming opportunities will be established at the foundation. And that was also addressed in the new processes. Campuses and complexes, we're, not, we're suggesting those not be available for naming. Uh, academic units, including colleges, would be a, uh, available for naming. We're still looking at a, a, a range uh, with minimum monetary values to be established anywhere from 30 to 100 percent based on the cost, the value, and the prominence of that naming and then lower MMVs to be established for term naming rights, which in fact would be limited time naming rights. That's a quick overview of a, and recap. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, there's, um, let me found it before I did. <laughs> so uh, B3.7. Paragraph two, uh, it references um, administration uh, having control over policy, and I think that may have just been a misnomer to be procedure rather than policies. They will the the board manages the A policies, not the B policies. B policies are board policies. The administration, the A policies are administrative policies. Those are policies, however, that we bring to this this group to approve and see. So board policy, there are two different levels of policies. Right. So we're kind of establishing those areas. The board policy is the overview. The administrative policies goes a little bit more into the detail. So that's the policy referred here. And Does that make sense? Clear. So not clear. Hmm? Is that not a procedure then? Not it, that makes it a no. procedure to me, not a policy. But I'm, we, yeah, we I'm, have B policies and we have A policies, and that's historic, historically how we have had it. Yeah. Um, B policies are approved by the board. A policies are changed and then provided to the board for information mm -hmm. only. So there are two levels of policies. Yeah. Yeah. There could there could actually be. Policies, yeah. procedures. Right. We do think. have some policies that are just A policies, and they are policies. I know on some of our work, the board sets certain policies, and some of it is by law or by statute, or, or, or those kind of parameters, or of course some certain visions that the board wants to have that administration is supposed to do. But we also have some administrative policies that could go down into extra layers into processes or procedures, but there are some things and some policies that administration can also set. So, I mean, it, it could be something if you want us to work on maybe some clarity for that within that section. But it's always been that way. You know. It's a little different. Yeah. <coughs> any other questions about anything? Is there any action that you need from us today on this? Um, if, if these policies, and primarily it's the board policy 3.7. It's a vote. Um, that we're looking at approval. 
but the A policies are there for support. The purpose of the A policies is to see the focus and the way that we're going to support the B policy. So we're looking, we're providing the administrative policies that are supporting the board policy. So if this is uh, to the approval of the board, yes, I'd like to. Okay, can you state the policy that you need us to take action on, please? The, B point, the B point. B3.7, do they need to approve the A's? No. They do not. No, B3.7. And repeat the policy? The yes. naming recognition policy. Okay, just like that. Just like that. Okay. Here we go. Any motion to approve that policy change? Anybody want to make a motion? Motion by Mr. Bennett. Do I'll I second have it. a second by Dr. Adame? Any public comment on that, on the naming policy change? Hearing no public comment, go ahead and call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against, same sign. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Moving on, I believe we're up to uh, number seven. Uh, Dr. Christina Wilson. Discussion, possible action, acceptance of the college's mission or vision, core values, and mission. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. On April 12th, we held a strategic planning board retreat in which we spent the day looking at data, priorities, and also a proposed mission, vision, and core value statement. We've been talking a lot this afternoon about ensuring that Del Mar College is current, our facilities, our technology, and the same thing goes for our mission, vision, and core values. Um, the last time that these were looked at and revised were in 2011. So it's a, it's a good time to take a look at this again and make sure that this, this is aligned with our current values and also make sure that this is in line with best practices. So um, we, uh, myself and the committee who were there at the last retreat, we took the feedback, um, what we heard from everybody, both the strengths and the weaknesses of what we proposed, and now we have an update. All right, so you all have seen this pyramid so many times at this point. We've had three board retreats and we touched on this each time, the fact that each piece of the plan builds upon each other. And what we're talking about today, the mission, values, and vision, they form the basis of the plan from which the goals and objectives and the eventual strategies and implementation will follow. All right, so let's rehash some definitions. I'm gonna start with the bottom of the pyramid, which is our mission. Our mission defines what we are here to do, what we do here every day at our board meetings, um, from morning to evening, what the college is here to do. The core values are those characteristics that are important to us in how we do our work. Those things that we want to make sure we integrate into all of our actions. And finally, at the top of the pyramid is our vision, what we aspire to achieve. We may not be there yet at our vision, but it's important that we keep um, a focus on what we strive to be always, always at the center. So those are the three different pieces we're going to be looking at today. When we met in April, there were several specific comments um, that were given, but in general, what we heard is that we wanted to make sure that there's emphasis on excellence, access, and student success, which you'll see are embedded into our core values, but also embedded into each of the three parts. We wanted to make sure that we had a core value related to stewardship and fiscal responsibility. That's an addition that you'll see in a minute. And also, we want to make sure that we are very clear about what we mean about diversity and our value surrounding diversity. Okay, so let's start with the bottom of the pyramid, which is the mission. Just want to emphasize what our accreditor, SACCOC, says about the mission. Higher education institutions, you could say, we all have similar goals, right? We're all striving to do similar things. What's important to SAC COC is that our mission defines us, Del Mar College, um, defines what we do. We are different than a and Corpus Christi. We are partners, but we have different goals. We serve different student groups. We offer different programs. And our mission needs to be very definitional, very clear, precise, and comprehensive. That's what our accreditor is looking for. Okay, so here is the updated mission proposal. 
What you see highlighted are some changes to the wording. Again, access was something that, that came up. We want to make sure that access is embedded within our mission statement. Affordability, that's core to what we do. And then, of course, success educational advancement. You can see that this mission statement also emphasizes that we are a multi-campus community college that offers a variety of different programs for the end means, the end goal of successful educational advancement and lifelong learning needs of our many communities. This is the proposal. I'd like to entertain any questions, comments, or concerns about the mission. Any questions? And we talked about it quite a bit at our retreat. The, the, the request was to bring it back before we met yeah. um, as a board focused on, as you all, you all as a board, um, at the next meeting, the idea was to come back and tap the wheel again, so to speak, to make sure that the, this was just kind of fresh on our minds coming in out of, from April to June, mm -hmm. where our next meeting is. And so. But I know that, yeah, that, that access and affordability were very important. Yes. Okay. And as Dr. Escamilla is alluding to, we are going to meet again about the strategic plan in June. As with all of these retreats, there's a lot of information to cover. So I know that there was some interest in bringing this back now so we can spend time in particular on this as it is a very important part of our plan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, there is another proposed mission a little bit further down, and I just wanted to make sure the ending is just a little bit different. I think one reads, it's very something very uh, simple, but one reads, um, uh, lifelong, oh, wait, needs of our community, and this one reads, and the other one reads. Can you go to the other one, the other mission that you have, proposed mission? The core, the core values. The vision. We, we no. have the core values and the vision. There's um, another mission statement. In this particular presentation, ma'am? Mm -hmm. There's another mission, sta mission okay. statement. Now, another mission statement that I saw, and uh, they have two different endings. One of hmm. them ends with uh, needs of our community, and the other one needs of its communities. Oh. Very something, very minor, but still. Yes, thank you, thank you. I actually, I see exactly what you mean. There was a one-page document with everything included, and you're right, I see that now. There's, there's its and ours, so we need to be consistent about that. Very minor, but still, I wanted to point that out thank to you. Thank you. I didn't catch that. I have a quick comment. Yes, um, I, I like it a lot. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, better, and you certainly encompassed what we discussed at the strategic planning. Um, the editor in me feels like it's a little long, Yes. and it is a mouthful. Um, off the top of my head, I don't see a lot of opportunities, though, to condense it, other than perhaps the phrase where it says, and continuing education opportunities. I think you could actually drop education there because you then say for the successful educational advancement and lifelong learning needs. So you might get a word there at least to shorten it just a tad. Remove education. You could say, I mm -hmm. mean, I'm obviously we're about education. I get that, but but yes. you say that in the second part. Yes, of that yes, I, I, I do see that. One comment I'd like to make, I believe that the committee was was making sure that we include our continuing education component of of our programming. So um, so I, I definitely see what you mean. It looks like it's a little bit redundant, but that was in reference to the actual arm of, of programs that we offer that are not uh, for credit, but are continuing education. I think it still does that without uh, uh, just because we don't use continuing education. Mm -hmm. I would think continuing opportunities includes continuing education. Okay. Uh, in, fa in fact, I think it includes it, but expands it to other things. Mm -hmm. It could be continuing employment opportunities. It could be continuing. So being general may cover that. I don't know. Okay. I like that, Libby. Mm -hmm. Continuing hobby. Hobby. And you're right. It is quite it is quite long, and that's the challenge in meeting the the requirements of our accreditors to be precise, comprehensive at the same time, and very distinct about the role that we serve. Okay. Is, is it you. important that we state that we're multi campus? Is that how critical is multi campus? It it is critical. Okay. Um, that's yes. I'll go with that. It, it, it really it really it really I see Dr. Lewis nodding to me. It really paints a picture about our scope. 
Okay. And that um, actually aligns really well with, with the earlier conversation about our, our facilities and the fact that we're moving to a district model. Uh, we're not just one campus and a few satellites. It, 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 it's a, a characteristic of our scope and our size. I defer. Okay, and I know each of these pieces are distinct, but they all go together. So if there's no more questions and comments, I'll go to the core values. All right, we have seven proposed core values, one more than the last time um, we met and you reviewed this. At the heart, of course, of the work that we do is student learning and success, and the other core values are also very, very important. Excellence in instruction, access, integrity, accountability, innovation, and diversity. Um, I'm not going to read each of them unless you want me to. They are the same as the last time with two exceptions. So here we have student learning and success, excellence in instruction, access. We can go back if you have any questions with these. Integrity. <clears throat> Accountability is the new value based on the feedback at the last retreat. It states that um, we will demonstrate responsible and ethical stewardship of the resources entrusted to us by the community. I hope that that, um, that, that meets the needs and, and captures what, what you conveyed. Is us the proper pronoun and not it? I don't know, it, just are we being consistent? Are we talking about its community and ah, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know which one's right. We have its, we have our rights, the inconsistency there, us, hmm. Uh, that's something I can definitely check with our our English faculty, our, the experts in that field, <laughs> which I don't consider myself to be um, the expert in that, but we can definitely check on what's right there. Just as a reminder, it's June 11th is the workshop. We'll talk about it a little bit more in calendaring, but while we're talking about the subject, uh, sure. you can make a note for mm -hmm. June 11th for the workshop for the strategic plan. Okay, great. And lastly, diversity. This one was reworked and strengthened to clarify what we mean by valuing diversity. Um, diversity is committing to a diverse and inclusive community that values, celebrates, and learns from our differences and in which all people are treated with dignity and respect. Any comments or questions or suggestions about the core values? I like it. Like it like it is. Any other questions, concerns? Again, Regents, this is for your consideration. It's at, a final approval will be at the end of the plan, and so this is really a matter of acceptance of, of everything's okay. It's it's doesn't we put it on the action item in case there was a we had that wiggle room or that opportunity to to act on anything. If there's um, there's, if there's nothing here, we can move it again. We can move it forward. This is more about just refreshment, to get refreshing to uh, the 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 uh, these these the, these part these parts of our mission and, and, and vision, and we'll bring it back to you. Ultimately, we'll we'll approve it all with the complete plan. So there's really no action that that's really necessary at this point. Mm -hmm. Your input is the bigger part of today. Okay. And moving on to the vision, just to reiterate, this is our description of what we intend to do, our strategic position. Again, this doesn't mean that we've attained this yet, but it's what we aspire to be and can work to, to, um, to center a vision around all of our activities, what we aspire to achieve. All right, and here is the updated vision. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. We heard at the last meeting that life-changing was very important. The committee felt the same way. We want to make sure that we reflect our impact on our communities, both locally and um, outside of our local area. We feel that our faculty and staff um, do empower our students, and we want them to continue to do so. And then finally, the aspirational piece, premier choice. Um, we know the quality that we offer. We know how we continue to improve, and we want to keep that at the front and center of our activities that we strive to be 
among the best or the best if we can be. It looks like you captured pretty much what we talked about the last uh, retreat. Does anybody Excellent. have any other concerns or questions or guidance? <laughs> Nothing. I think we're okay for now. Thank you. Right. I appreciate that. Please. And you've seen this before already. The yes. mission and vision represent the current and envisioned state of the institution. The strategic plan is used to bridge the gap between the two. The uh, Strategic Planning Committee is working diligently to put a draft together. That's another reason why we wanted to come here today and get your feedback so that if the committee needed to hash this out again, tweak it again, then we can be ready for the June the June retreat. But we're looking forward to sharing that draft with you. Was the, the, was the committee okay with the changes or the, the, pro, the things that we presented at the last retreat? They were, they were, and I'll tell you, and again, the access, success, the adding of the values, it made sense to them. But just just as the Board of Regents struggled with premier choice, first choice, it's we struggled because we, we want to be aspirational. We know we do a great job, but we want to be the best that we can be. So finding that wording um, and, was and, and continuing still, and to still, be a challenge. And still meet what we need to do with SACS. Correct. So meet their criteria. Yes. So okay. committees on board, committees happy, and glad to hear that that we were able to take that and incorporate what you what you liked. Okay. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. Okay. Let's move on to the next item, and that's a discussion and possible action related to approval of revised and adoption of new board policies. Dr. No, Tammy, I believe is up. Yes, good afternoon. I'll go ahead and, ad and address um, two things. One, first I'll address, I know it was mentioned earlier on your pending item list for the project that the board approved at the end of last year to do a comprehensive review of the entire policy manual and to uh, make revisions to titles to reflect our current designations. That uh, project continues to be a work in process. Um, the project is a manual process. It is taking a bit longer than I anticipated. And I'm working on having a summary of that to the board in June. To the board in June. Um, as with this policy work that's before you today, um, this is a result of our SAC COC reaffirmation efforts to clarify and better align with the current SAC COC standards. I know Dr. Lewis has been up before you several times um, to explain that the standards in SACs have changed. Um, for this go around, and that actually we're one of the first, we're the first class, I believe, that has to adhere to those changes in standards. So when your standards change, then we have to take a look at some of the policies. So this is the beginning of the policy work that that uh, SACS committee is, is working on. We, we've divided up the standards, and we're charged with going and looking at the policies that align with those standards. So all the policy work that you see in front of you is a um, direct result from the, the SACS COC committee. Um, also, I've incorporated um, any revisions or additions for title changes that are part of that, that larger comprehensive policy work. So if any title changes have been made, like to our active uh, policy menu online, it has been through this process, which is the individual policies that's come to the board for approval if they're B or notification if they're A. Um, no larger project title changes have been made to the active policy online to date. Like I said, it's still an offline manual work in progress. Okay. So um, you have um, revisions to board policies, which was um, presented to you, B611, which is structural program review, B7.5 admissions, admissions, we added section B7.5.1. Then we have some new board policies, which the SACS COC standards said basically that the board will have policies for certain things. And it's awarding credit, and it has several related sections about awarding credit, uh, policy on distance learning, and a policy about an institutionally related foundation. So if you have any questions for any of the policy work that was in your packet, I'm here to answer those. Or I do have backup. And this doesn't require any action. Yes, right? sir. Um, yes, sir. The discussion and possible action related to the approval of revised and adoption of new board policies. And it's the numbers that, uh, so it's B611, B7.5 with B7.5.1, 
5.1, B7.29 with sections 1, 2, and 3, B7.33, and B3.6. Anybody have any questions about any of these revisions, any policies? If no, but I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Rivas, that we approve the revived board policies and the new policies. Good. Okay, we have a motion. Do I hear a second? I have a second from Hector Salinas. Uh, any public comment on these policies or the motion? If not, we'll go ahead and entertain a motion to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those again, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, good. Now we can go ahead and move on to general public comments. Jay? Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. or ja no, Jackie Adamson. Jackie Adamson. Jack? Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Jackie Adamson. I'm a citizen, I'm a taxpayer, and I'm an associate professor of psychology at Del Mar, ending coming into the end of my 11th year with Del Mar. Excuse me. I would like to present to you today a grievance complaint whistleblower report in accord with board policy 5.50 5 and 5.43. I'm asking the board to put this item, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to be passing out copies for each member of the board as well as for the general counsel. Um, I'm asking the board to put this item on their agenda for a closed session so I can present it to you in my, with my representative as soon as possible. Um, I have exhausted all prior remedies. It's been ongoing since November. It started with lower level supervisors, and in March, when there was finally no due process at those levels, I filed a grievance complaint whistleblower with HR, and that was stalled for about six weeks. Um, I filed an appeal of uh, promotion uh, in March, the end of March, and the president halted that process for about two months. I filed a grievance complaint whistleblower with the president on May 6th, and at the 11th hour, the president again halted that process. I'm not involved in the lawsuit with the college. It's my right by policy to file this with the board once I've exhausted all lower avenues. I have no control over the process. I've followed policy. Uh, but administration continues to delay unilaterally and calls timeouts. DMC, it, it's been an ongoing, what appears to me, retaliation to the current point. It's almost daily. The last action the college uh, organized against me was yesterday, May 13th. The one before that was Sunday, Mother's Day, uh, May 12th. Um, it's a simple case. It's a very simple case. You tell the truth, you follow policy, and you do what's right. That's all I'm asking. Okay. It's not, it's not one DMC, not, I should say not one DMC official has presented one piece of evidence, not one piece of evidence has been presented to me, okay, to support their position, okay? No facts. They have my facts. They have had my facts. Nothing's been acted on, okay? Um, I have followed policy. I've met the, di the, the deadlines. I've met the timelines that policy requires me to, and I've, I've hit it roadblocks all the way. Your, your three minutes are up, so if you can just finish up your thought. Okay. And we have the material to, to read. Okay. 
Um, anyway, so if you could please, I'm, I'm asking if you could please put this on the board's agenda for a closed session um, so that uh, I can finally get some due process. And I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jack Gordy. See here. Time's up. He is here? No, he's not here. Oh, he's not here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is there anybody else that didn't sign up that would like to address this board under closed session? If not, then we'll go ahead and move on to... Yeah, back there. Pardon? Uh, Dr. Klein. Oh, Dr. Klein. Jim, I'm sorry. Come on up. Uh, good afternoon. My name is James Klein. Uh, I live at 3501 Monterey Street here in Corpus Christi. Um, I'm speaking to you today as a faculty member at Del Mar College, and also as the president of the Del Mar College chapter of the AAUP. Um, and I was prompted to come before you today by the earlier discussion of the uh, proposed new building, the Gamby, I guess it's being called temporarily, um, on the East Campus here. Um, and so I took the, wanted to take the time to step forward to thank the administration at the college here for its commitment to quality instruction here at Del Mar College. The administration has assured faculty repeatedly during their planning and construction of this new building that a hallmark of Del Mar College, small class sizes, will continue as we move forward. This also fits sentiments of students. According to student surveys offered in October 2017, they stated that next to cost, the most common reason they came for Del to Del Mar College was class size. Maintaining current class sizes will also allow fulfillment of Del Mar College's mission statement as it current exi currently exists. Uh, and I would just editorialize that the word quality really should be in the new mission statement as well. To offer quality in education for student and community success. On a personal note, I have taught large classes at Oklahoma State University and Georgia State University, and those large numbers dramatically influence the nature of instruction and can particularly misserve first generation students. Additionally, the Texas uh, Coordinating Board, the co board's urging of colleges to focus on written communication becomes very difficult to achieve in larger class sizes. And so I would reiterate again, thank you, President Escamilla, Vice President Lewis, and members of your administrative team uh, for your support of quality education at Del Mar College. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Is there anybody else that didn't sign up that would like to address this board under public comments? If not, then we'll go ahead and move on to closed session. And hold on while I read the language. Um, Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation or legal claims or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel, possible discussion and action in open session. And B, Texas Government Code 551.074A1, personal matters regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, including one, annual evaluation of the college president, two, annual board self-evaluation, and three, regent duties, responsibilities, statement of ethics with possible discussion, action, and open session, and get to the last page. Hang in there. And C, Texas Government Code 551.073, deliberation regarding prospective gift, regarding prospective gift or donation with possible discussion and action in open session. And we'll take about a five minute break to clear the room and we'll proceed with closed session. Thank you.
board completed our closed session at 524 p.m. And I believe that we have one action item ready to complete. The board did complete its self-evaluation for 2019, and we're prepared to take action on executing our action plan. And I'll entertain a motion to do so. Hector will make the motion. Do we hear a second? Anybody second by Mary Sherwood <coughs> or Libby? Libby? Okay. Any discussion on that from the board? Anything under public comment on our motion? If not, we'll go ahead and have a vote on it. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those against, same sign. And the motion passes. Now let's uh, move on to calendaring. I'll move through that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Want to go ahead and jump in there? Yeah, please. Okay. So just really quickly, Regents. Um, this weekend, um, Friday, May 17th, 5 p.m. at the Richardson Performance Hall, the Collegiate, uh, grad Collegiate High School and Harold T. Branch Academy uh, graduations. Well, let me let me go back. Sorry. Harold T. Branch Academy is at five o'clock. Richard Richard Richardson Performance Hall, Collegiate High School graduation immediately after at seven o'clock. I know there'll be a few regents there. I know uh, Dr. Seba will be there. I may be there, uh, depending on a few other items. Uh, Memorial Day will be the following day. Also, signee die the last day of the legis uh, legislative session. I will be there. I will get there Sunday night and be there all day Monday. Uh, moving into June, uh, big next big fundraiser for the Del Mar College Foundation is Stringers for Scholarships. Uh, it begins Friday with the captain's party at 5.30 to 7.30 at marker 37, and the tournament will ensue the following day. Uh, a lot of fun there. Come on out, just wear shorts, it's hot. Um, following uh, week, uh, June, 11th will be a workshop and board meeting. The workshop will be the strategic planning um, for the college. Uh, that following week will be the CAT annual conference and that'll be in Austin, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, moving into July. Obviously the 4th of July will be that first week, um, regular board meeting with a workshop is tentative. I think we have a tentative workshop there to roll in some uh, budget meetings, budget discussions, and so forth. Um, will be the same day as the regular board day on June, July 9th, excuse me. Um, and July 20th is the Mexican American Studies Summer Seminar. It'll be, it'll actually start, I think it starts the day before. Friday. Mm -hmm. It Friday. does, it starts Saturday. the 19th. We'll get more details as that comes closer um, in, in the 20th. I know I'll be there the 19th. I don't know if I'm gonna be there for both, but again, a fantastic summer seminar on our local uh, culture, um, kind of cultural studies and so forth, Mexican American studies, just fantastic. And then you'll see the, the required board meetings moving into August are all self-explanatory there, but again, um, August 13th will be the board day surrounded by all the requisite um, budget meetings uh, to conclude our academic year and conclude our budget year and start our our new uh, budget cycle. That concludes my announcements for calendar, Mr. Chair. Okay. Oh, just, do you know when we're going to start the workshop on the 11th? No, I don't know that, but I will get that out okay. this week. We will nail that down. I, I, I think it's a... Um, Gosh, it's it's like a 9:30. I I'll, I'll have to double check. That's fine. It'll be whenever you know. Yes, ma'am. We'll 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 know here by the end of tomorrow. Anything else to add to calendaring? Hearing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you.